Thank you for coming to Then Radio. Please like, subscribe, or click the link below to join our Patreon. Thanks again. In just a moment, X minus one. But first, after a hard day's work, there's nothing more welcome than an evening of variety entertainment. That's just the tonic provided tomorrow night by NBC Radio. You'll laugh your cares away when good-natured contestants carry out the rib-tickling stunts dreamed up by MC Jack Bailey on NBC's Truth or Consequences. Later on, Groucho Marx peps things up with lots of spontaneous good fun and more of the friendly insults at which he is so accomplished. For a brighter, livelier evening tomorrow night, it's Groucho Marx and Truth or Consequences on this station. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Bad Medicine by Finn O'Donovan. But first, farmers know they can't stop storms, floods, or droughts from ruining a crop. But they can make sure things like that can't ruin them by investing in United States savings bonds. Not only farmers, but over 40 million Americans in all sorts of jobs own 40 billions of savings bonds. And why? Because savings bonds are the easy way to start saving and to keep saving. And the money you invest in savings bonds mean protection now and ready cash when you need it in the future. Improving the farm, sending the youngsters to college, or planning your own retirement. These are the big things you can be ready for with savings bonds. And besides offering you a safe investment, each Series E savings bond pays you back $4 at maturity for every three you invest. Yes, you earn extra dollars while you save. So start saving now. For the big things in your life, be ready with United States savings bonds. And now, on with our story. On May 2nd, 2103... Elwood Caswell walked rapidly down Broadway. It was a gentle, misty spring day, and the air held the smell of rain and blossoming trees. But Elwood Caswell didn't smell the rain and the trees. He just gripped the loaded gun he had in his pocket. He didn't want to use the weapon, but he was certain that he would. This was justifiable. You see, Elwood Caswell was a homicidal maniac. Why shouldn't I kill him? Hey, look out, will you? Oh, sorry, sir. Only the other day he said to me, Elwood, you're looking very well. What business is it of his how I look? Hey there, Elwood. Elwood. Huh? It's me, Marty Klein. I work on the jet buses with you, remember? Oh, yeah, of course. Hello, Marty. Uh, forgive me, my mind was, uh, was on other things. Yeah, I know how it is. A couple of weeks ago, I was walking around in a fog so thick you could cut it. Yeah, really? Sure. Preoccupied, you know. I had this idea in my mind. You too? Yeah. The same person? Huh? Were you troubled by the same person? My wife. Hey, you okay? Oh, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Well, I had this idea, see. I was going to get rid of my wife. Kill her? Kill her? I mean, send her to a country for a week. Oh. You sure you ain't sick? No, I never felt better. Well, well, anyway, I was going to take a week off. Quit the jet buses. Hey, can you imagine? 
I've been a jet bus operator for 10 years now, and all of a sudden, I feel like I, I can't take it for another minute. I know how you feel. And I was going to take a trip all by myself. A trip? To where? To the farthest place I could think, to Mars. I was just going to pick up and take a vacation to Mars. Silly, huh? I don't know. What happened? Well, I talked it over with Ethel. Your wife? Yeah. Ethel, she's a real sensible girl. You know what she did? No, am I supposed to? Well, Ethel went right down to that uh, home therapy appliance store, and she says, you got a home therapy machine that'll cure my husband of uh, this idea he can't stay on the jet buses? I've heard that those machines aren't perfected. They got him licked now. So, okay, she describes the trouble, and next day they deliver this thing, and, and boom, I plug it in, see? And, and? And a voice talks to me. It starts asking me questions. Yeah, what kind of questions? All kinds. Things I, I won't even tell my own mother. You told the machine? Why not? It's only a machine. Yeah, I see your point. Well, then the machine starts to tell me a few things. And before I knew it, inside a week, I'm cured. Now, I, I can't wait to go back driving the jet buses. You don't say. So that's why I say I, I know how it is to have one thing on your mind all the time like that. This machine, what did it cost you? That's the beauty part of it. <laughs> By Ethel. Boy, she's a smart girl. After a week, she sends it back, see? She says it don't work. So all we lose is the deposit. Yeah, I see. Well, I got to go back to work now. Hey, ain't you working the jet buses today? Huh? No, I'm off today. Well, I'll see you, Elwood. Yeah, see you, Marty. Uh, what was the name of that place? Where they sell the home therapy machines. Yeah. Uh, home therapy appliances. It's right down Broadway, about two blocks from here. So long, Elwood. Perspiring freely, Elwood Caswell continued down Broadway toward 43rd Street. His friend Magnuson would be finishing work soon, returning to his apartment less than a block from Caswell's. Elwood gripped the gun tighter. How pleasant it would be to saunter in, exchange a word with him, and then... No. No, I won't do it. I don't really want to kill anybody. It isn't right. Think what'll happen. The authorities will lock me up. My friends won't understand, and... Mother. Mother would never approve. Still, if I see Magnuson, if I see his hateful, accusing face in front of me... Oh, this must be the store. Yeah. Home therapy appliances. Good afternoon, sir. Can I show you some of our home therapy appliances? I, I want therapy. Quick. Of course, sir. This way, please. Now then, this is our new alcoholic reliever built by International Combustion Motors and advertised in leading magazines. A handsome piece of furniture. I think you will agree and not out of place in any home. It also opens into a television set. Uh, look, what I need... A therapy, of course. I just want to point out this model need never cause embarrassment to you, your friends, or your loved ones. Notice, if you will, the recessed dial which controls the desired degree of alcoholism. You see, heavy, moderate, social... Light and <laughs> teetotal. A new feature unique in mechanotherapy. I'm not alcoholic. The New York Jet Bus Authority does not hire alcoholics. Oh, sorry. You seem the type. No offense. I... Please. You seem rather nervous. Perhaps the portable anxiety reducer. No. Well, sir, perhaps if you told me just what you feel is bothering you. What have you got for homicidal mania? I beg your pardon? Homicide. The urge to kill someone. Oh, oh, of course. Well, let's see now. Oh, pardon uh, me. Uh, have you worked here very long? A week. Oh, yes. Here's the ticket. This black job with the chrome trim. What is it? This, sir, uh, is a Rex Regenerator, built by Planetary Motors Corporation. Handsome, hmm? Goes with any decor, opens into a well-stocked little bar, so your family, friends, loved ones need never... Well, a cure homicidal urge, a strong one. Oh, absolutely. Don't confuse this with the little 10-amp neurosis model. This is a hefty, heavy-duty 25-amp machine for really deep-rooted conditions. That's what I've got. Well, this baby will jolt you out of it. Big, heavy-duty thrust bearings, oversized heat absorbers, completely insulated. Sensitivity range I'll over... I'll take it. Yes, sir. With me, right now. Now? Before it's too late. I'll pay cash. Well, yes, sir. It'll be a few hours before the warehouse can... I'll take this one here. Well, that's a floor demonstration. Does it work? All of our demonstrators work. Sir. Then I'll take it. I can't wait for a warehouse. I can't wait for anything. Have it put in a taxi for me. Yes, sir. Tell them to hurry. I, I want to kill my friend Magnuson, you know. Who? My friend Magnuson. Oh, of course. That'll be $400.59, sales tax included. Mm -hmm. 
After Elwood Caswell left the store, the clerk, whose name was Haskins, smiled to himself and lighted a cigarette. He had made his first sale. He inhaled. Haskins? Yes, Mr. Follinsby? Smoking, smoking. I ask you to rid yourself of that filthy habit. Immediately, Mr. Follinsby. Uh, I'll use one of the display model denicotinizers at once. By the way, I, I just made a rather good sale, sir. Oh, really? Yes, sir. One of our big Rex regenerators. Well, now, it isn't often we... Wait a minute. Where's the floor model? Well, sir, the customer was in an awful hurry. He was going to kill his friend. You and... gave him the floor model? Uh, well, yes, sir. Was there any reason why... Oh, I... grief, Haskins. Didn't I inform you we never sell a floor model? Uh, but, sir... Good heavens! I've got to get to him. What was his address? Address? His name, then. Well, he didn't say. Then his check. But he paid cash. You mean you just let him pick up the machine and walk out? Well, sir, he paid cash. He was homicidal, you say? Yes, sir, his friend. I don't care about his friend. Get the police. No, 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 no. Uh, call the Planetary Motor Security Division. Quick. Yes, at once. Well, well. Excuse me, Mr. Follinsby. What will I tell them? Just tell them, you fool. Uh, tell them that one of our customers has accidentally got that display regenerator they sent us. The one they shipped by accident. They were going to replace it tomorrow. Yes, sir. The one they shipped by accident. Will they know? If they don't be more explicit, tell them we've sold the Martian model. The one for treating psychotic Martians. <laughs> Meanwhile, Elwood Caswell had returned to his apartment and lugged the big black Rex regenerator into his living room. He put it down near the couch and studied it carefully. He was right. It does go with the room. Now then, let's see those instructions. Place regenerator near a comfortable couch. All right. Plug-in machine. There. A fixed contact band to your forehead. That's all there is to it. Just turn on the machine and it will do the rest. There will be no language problem since your regenerator communicates with you by direct sensory contact, patent pending. Well, that seems easy enough. Now, I'll just put the contact on my head. And... Blast it. Hello? Elwood? Yes? This is Henry. Henry Magnuson, how are you, old boy? I'm fine. I wondered if you were doing anything tonight. Thought you might like to drop over for a game of chess. Game of chess, huh? You stupid oaf. What? Nothing. I thought you called me a stupid oaf. I'm just talking <laughs> to my cat. <laughs> oh, I didn't remember you had a cat. I thought you hated cats. Oh, I do. Uh, this isn't really mine. It's a neighbor's. Uh, it keeps coming in. Oh, what about tonight? Will you be alone? Well, yeah. You haven't mentioned to anyone that you're inviting me over? Not a soul. Why? Someone's looking for me, uh, a process server. Oh. Now, I've been avoiding him for days. I don't even leave word where I'll be when I go out. Well, you can trust me, Elwood. I'm your best friend. Yes, you are. But not for long. Huh? Uh, just talking to the cat again. Oh. Well, will you be over? Yeah. In about an hour, okay? Yeah, an hour will be fine. There are a few things I have to do I've just gotten some new laugh records from the boys at the office. I got something here that'll really kill you. So long, Elwood. So long. I've got something here that'll kill you, too. X minus one will continue in one minute. Each of us has a personal reason for wanting to see cancer conquered. Steve Allen would like to tell you his. I have a wife and three wonderful kids. And when I think about cancer going to strike one American in every four, well, that's more than enough reason for wanting to see it conquered. I know that some people don't even want to think about cancer. But pretending it's not a threat, doing an ostrich routine, isn't going to get us anywhere. We've got to stand up to it and fight. We can fight, each and every one of us. Through the American Cancer Society, we can be part of the battle that someday will beat cancer once and for all. That day will come, but you and I have got to help. How about it? Thank you, Steve Allen. Remember, fight cancer with a checkup and a check. See your doctor once a year for a checkup. It's your best cancer insurance. And to help conquer cancer, send a check to your unit of the American Cancer Society. Make it generous. And now, on with our story. Taking the revolver from his pocket, 
Elwood laid it on the table in front of him. His face became suffused with hatred at the thought of Magnuson. He poked at the gun with a stiff forefinger. Magnuson, you no good, shifty-eyed enemy of all that's decent in the world. The man who ruined my sister Irene. The man who... Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Elwood. You have no sister, remember? No sister. Now, before you go off and commit murder, why not just try that machine just once, huh? Turn it on. Okay, now reach over and... Good afternoon, Elwood. I am your mechanical therapist. You may call me Gloop. Gloop? You seem surprised. It is a perfectly common name here on this planet. Gloop? Of course. I've heard it many times. Now then, I am scanning the material in your pre-conscious with the intent of synthesis, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. Yes? I find... Hmm. This is a most unusual case. Really? I thought it was simple homicidal mania. There is, of course, no such thing. You are obviously hallucinating a set of symptoms. Nonsense syllables to enable you to avoid the real problem. Oh? Hmm. A most unusual set of symptoms, I must say. Your pilot light seems to be fading. My light is not fading. I am merely trying to relate your symptoms to proven theory. Well, as long as you know what you're doing. Mechanotherapy is an exact science, Elwood. It admits of no significant errors. We will proceed. Good. First, the word association test. Fire away. I will proceed to give a word. You answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Ready? Ready. House. Home. Planet. Earth. Hmm. Hmm? Uh, just musing. Now, fleeful. Fleeful? Fleeful. That sounds like a Martian word. Just give me a response. Fleeful, hmm? Okay. I can make them up, too. Marfouche. That's a pretty good one, huh? Made it up in the spur of the moment. Marfouche is very significant. It is a corruption of the Martian concept of fush clib. Very significant. I don't know any Martian words. Aha, uh -huh, noteworthy. We will proceed. Loud. Soft. Green. Mother. Panagoyas. Pathamathunga. <laughs> How's that one? Arities. Nexothesmodrustica. Top that. Cateeth a snow hell gnoptices. Okay. Rigamaroo, Kalamazoo, Iggity Bibbidi Boo. Good. It fits the pattern. Pattern? Your neurosis. I can diagnose it now. Go on. You have a classic case of theme desire, complicated by strong dwarkish intentions. I could have sworn I was homicidal. The term has no reference. It must be rejected as nonsense. Now, if you'll just settle back on the couch, we'll proceed. <laughs> At precisely this moment, a tall, gnarled, ugly man pushed his way through the doors of home therapy appliances. His clothing, unpressed and uncaring, hung on him like corrugated iron. When the clerk, Hoskins, approached him, he flipped back his lapel to show a small silver badge underneath. Sir? John Rath, Planetary Motor Security Division. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Follinsby, Mr. Follinsby. Yes, sir. Hello, Follinsby. Mr. Rath. Uh... Well? So far, we haven't a single lead. You certainly never mentioned his name? Oh, yes, sir. Now, think. Is there anything significant? Is it serious, Mr. Rath? Mr. Follinsby, this man is homicidal. Won't it treat him? Homicide is unknown on Mars. It'll treat him for the most likely Martian sickness. What would that be? Theme desire, Mr. Follinsby. Theme desire? It's a Martian illness in which the victim feels cursed by the tree-like nourishing parent. Although, of course, Martians don't have parents in the ordinary sense. Well, Haskins? I, I remember one thing. He mentioned he was a jet bus operator for the New York Jet Bus Authority. Ah. Uh, one other thing. Yes? I believe, uh, yes, he was alcoholic. An alcoholic jet bus operator. Excellent. It'll be on his records. Get the Jet Bus Authority at once. Surely, Elwood, you remember your Gorisi. No. Tell me then about your juvenile experiences with the Forestrian fleet. Never had one. Mm, complete blockage. My father... There is no you... such thing, of course. But... I thought we'd finally agreed on that. Okay, if you say so. Now then, since you claim you don't even know what a Gorisi is, tell me what you imagine it to be. Um, a forest fire. Uh, a salt tablet? A small screwdriver? Am I getting warm? 
A revolver? Uh-uh. What the heck is a Gorisy? Why, the tree that nourished you into puberty. No tree nourished me. You have completely repressed the experience. No tree ever nourished me. Mr. Caswell, let me try to explain your case as best I can. Somewhere in your childhood, your Gorisy, or parent tree, stifled your theme desire. Now, this gave rise to your present urge to dwarf someone in a Flendish manner. To what? To dwarf someone in a Flendish manner. Listen, you crummy piece of hardware. I have never had a Gorisy. I have no desire to dwarf someone in a Flendish manner or any other manner. All I want to do is put a bullet into Herbert Magnuson. Understand? All I want to do is kill Magnuson. Lie down, Mr. Caswell. We'll go over it again. My dear man, I'm not trying to insinuate that the Jet Bus Authority hires alcoholics. If you will just... Uh, Any luck? It's a dead end. Now, Haskins. Yes, sir. A man's life may be at stake here. Now, think. Was there anything else this fellow said to you? Anything? Well, he did mention the name of his friend. Of which friend? The one he was going to kill. The one he... Why didn't you say so? Now, what was it? Uh, uh, Magnuson. You sure? That's it. He said, I'm going to kill Magnuson. You know, just casually like that. Follinsby, see if there's a Magnuson in the Manhattan phone book. Now, hurry it up. Yes, Mr. Caswell, you were saying? Well... Something about your Gorisy. Yes, I was saying I... I think perhaps you're right. Naturally. But right about what, Mr. Caswell? Well, I think perhaps... Yes, I think perhaps I do remember my Gorisy. Ah! Now, Mr. Caswell, we're on the road to a cure. <laughs> Mr. Magnuson? Yes? Do you know a short, angry-looking, red-haired man? I might. Oh, thank heaven. Or I might not. Can you tell us where to locate him? You're a process server, huh? Certainly not. Don't kid me. Mr. Magnuson, this man is trying to kill you. Go on. You're full of happy pills. Elwood's my best friend. Elwood? He loves me like a brother. And if you think I'm going to stick some process server on Mr. Magnuson, I'm not a process server. Your friend Elwood is a psychopathic killer. You're his intended victim. Can you get that through your thick skull? I'm trying to save your life. Yes? You're Elwood Caswell? Yes. The Elwood Caswell who bought a Rex regenerator early this afternoon? Yes. Won't you come in? Thank you. My name is Rath, Planetary Motors. Nice to meet you. Uh, have you uh, used the machine? Oh, yes. I see. Now, Mr. Caswell, I, uh, I don't know how to explain this, but uh, we made a terrible mistake. The regenerator you took was a Martian model for giving therapy to Martians. I know. You do? Yes, it became pretty obvious after a while. Well, it, was a, it was a dangerous situation, especially for a man in your condition. Yes, the poor thing tried its best, but of course it couldn't cure what wasn't there. Well, then the, uh, the company will, of course, reimburse you for your lost time and your, well, your mental anguish. Naturally. And we will uh, substitute a regular uh, human-type regenerator. Oh, that won't be necessary. You see... Uh, Mr. Caswell, you put down that gun... I warn you. I'm not going to shoot you. I merely want to turn this gun over to you. You do? Yes, I'm not going to shoot anybody. You mean that... The machine's attempt at therapy forced me to reappraise my whole self. There was an insight during which I was able to get rid of my obsession. You no longer want to kill your friend Magnuson? Kill Magnuson? Why, I haven't the faintest urge. <laughs> well, I... I must say, then, it, uh, it worked out for the best. I, uh, I'll i get back to the store and have him pick up this machine in an hour. And oh, Well, sir... Oh, uh, don't forget to take this gun. I, I won't need it. Well, of course. Uh, well, nice to have met you, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. 
Did you hear that? He asked me if I still intended to kill Magnuson. Magnuson, that inhuman monster who cut down my Gorosy. Magnuson, the man who even now is secretly planning to infect New York with abhorrent fiend desire. Am I going to kill him? Oh, no. I wish him a long life, a life filled with the torture I can now inflict on him. Kill Magnuson? Oh, no. I'm going to start right now to dwork him in a vlendish manner. <laughs> You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Honorable Opponent by Clifford D. Simak, the story of an Earth general with the distasteful assignment of meeting a delegation of unmilitary clowns who arrive as conquerors. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. In a moment, tonight's cast and a preview of next week's exciting drama. They took the blue from the sky, then the pretty girl's eyes, and the touch of old glory too. And gave it to the men who proudly wear the U.S. Air Force blue. The U.S. Air Force blue. Oh, we are men with a dream of America's scene. We're a rugged and ready crew. And you can bet your boots the world looks up to you. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Bad Medicine, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Finn O'Donovan and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Cliff Carpenter, Bill Britton, Alan Manson, Charles Webster, Carl Weber, and Joseph Julian. Norman Rose was heard as the machine. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Bob Maurer and is an NBC Radio Network production. Weekday, the companion and advisor to America's women, offers a new informative series on childbirth. It's the actual case history of a young wife following her through the late stages of pregnancy, childbirth, and postnatal care. You'll attend the childbirth courses offered at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital and even enter the delivery room for the actual birth of the child. Listen tomorrow for the real-life series, The Story of Birth. Then, on the same program, listeners can also enjoy more women specialties, Kitchen Hints by Charlotte Adams. Child Care News with Dr. Francis Horwich. Vacation Ideas offered by Walter Kiernan. And another personal visit with your radio friend, Mary Margaret McBride. Don't forget the exciting dramatization each day from Taylor Carwell's book, Tender Victory. Be sure to join Virginia Graham and Mike Wallace tomorrow on this NBC station. Follow the news with Chet Huntley tonight on NBC Radio. <laughs> In just a moment, X-1, but first, here's an important date to remember. It's this Sunday when the highly acclaimed program On the Line with Bob Considine premieres on NBC Radio. Behind each news event is a human interest story. And beginning Sunday, you can hear these fascinating sidelights with commentator Bob Considine. You'll also meet the important people who make the headlines, people from the government, labor, and management, or perhaps someone in your own hometown today. The latest news becomes more meaningful when you understand the human interest. So make a day to hear On the Line with Bob Considine. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, The Old Die Rich by H.L. Gold. The uniformed cop at the door told me to get lost. But Lou Pape spotted me and told the man to let me in. It was a shabby room. They always are. There was a woman on the bed, an old woman with white hair, thin enough to show the tight-drawn scalp. The medical examiner was going over her as if she were a side of beef that you had to put a federal grade stamp on. When are you going to stop taking this ham friend of yours around to these cases, Sergeant, just to gratify his morbid curiosity? Forget about Weldon, Doc. What did she die of? Not eating, malnutrition. Oh, now look, Doc, in the top bureau drawer, she had bank books showing $32,000 from five different banks. Now, she had the price of a meal. Malnutrition induced by senile psychosis. They starve because they're less afraid of death than digging into their savings. I don't know, Doc. It doesn't feel right to me. Listen, Weldon, just because you get up on a stage or on some half-baked television show and make believe you're 70 years old doesn't qualify you as an expert on gerontology. Maybe not, Doc. But I went bald at 25, and I've been playing old men ever since. There's a lot more to it than just shuffling around and talking in a high-cracked voice. Yeah, there hasn't been an actor since Otis Skinner. (laughs) Maybe. But the way I work, I have to get inside the character. I have to decide when he was born, how he got along with his father, where he went to school, what he thinks of women, everything about a character. There isn't a one of them these days can make themselves heard past the fifth row. Look, Look, I'm serious. Now, I've tried imagining myself growing weak from hunger. I've tried to think of not even spending a nickel to keep me from dying. I... Well, I just don't believe it. It isn't right. I don't feel it. Well, lucky for me, I don't have to feel these things inside of me because I'm a doctor and not an actor. Sergeant, malnutrition induced by senile psychosis. I'll order the wicker basket from Bellevue. So long, Barrymore. Well, he's right, Mark. We get a couple of these cases every year. Some old bat starving to death with $17,000 in old bills pinned on his union suit. Time's up all the time. Well, it doesn't feel right. Well, he knows his business. But he doesn't know old people. I do. It isn't easy to starve to death. Not when you can buy day-old bread at the bakery or wilted vegetables the grocer's ready to throw out. Anyone who's willing to eat that stuff can stay alive from day to day. Hunger is a... Well, it's a pretty potent instinct. Maybe they get too sick to go out after old bread or wilted vegetables. It takes weeks to die of starvation. Did you ever try starving for weeks, Lou? No, did you? Well, the point is, somebody would find out, a janitor, a landlord, somebody, and they'd get him to a hospital. Ah, forget about it, Mark. Can't argue with it. Here, there were five bank books, $32,000. Yeah, she took good care of them. They look almost new. Sure she did. Most important thing in the world, huh? April 23rd, 1907, $150. The ink's pretty dark. Shouldn't it be faded? (laughs) She probably never took it out in the light. Anyone ever think of testing the ink? What for? Banks records always check. These aren't forgeries, if that's what you're thinking. Well, uh, I'd like to get a chemist working on this ink. Ah, now, Mark. Look, this is strictly against regulations. I got to take these books down to the squad room and sign them in. Pretty dark ink for 1907. Well, it's about five o'clock in the afternoon. I guess I could hold them over tonight and bring them down to the property clerk in the morning. Good. I know where I can find a chemist. Mr. Weldon, there's no doubt of it. The ink sample is typical of inks used 50 years ago. Uh, 1907 would be about right. There, you see, Weldon? I was supposed to go to the trotters tonight. But according to the amount of oxidation, it's fresh enough to be only a few months old. There, I was right. Well, could not, uh, could not be the result of unusually careful handling, though? No, oh, yes, yes, I suppose it could. An airtight compartment, perhaps... Sealed with one of the inert gases or a vacuum, that might account for the lack of normal aging. Lou, you can't keep inert gases in a top bureau drawer in a fourth-floor walk-up. 
Yeah. Well, it's probably some simple explanation. For fresh ink, half a century old. <laughs> I've been going out on these cases for about a year. It's my specialty playing old people, and when I'm not working television or something on Broadway, I go down to the homes for the aged or the parks or just watch. Lou Pape's an old friend of mine, and he put me on these malnutrition cases. But there was more to it than just picking up color and tricks of the trade. There had to be a better reason for it. You can't just starve to death with upwards of $30,000 right at your fingertips. Not without at least buying a bowl of soup. I had a run of television that kept me busy for about a month. Then Lou Pate called me up and asked me to come down to Bellevue. I'll autopsy if you want it, Sergeant, but I can give you the cause of death right now. Malnutrition due to senile psychosis. Uh, what's up, Lou? Well, uh, Mark, an old guy was found wandering around down on Hester Street. Suffering from malnutrition, he had $17,000 in cash inside the lining of his jacket. Is, uh, is he alive? No, not now he isn't. Doc's got him in the room there, but he was stumbling around when the cop on the beat picked him up. Did he say anything? Well, he talked to the cop. Pretty smart young kid. Seems the old man kept talking about money and about his wife. She must have been dead 20 years. And then just before he went out completely, he did say something. Maybe three or four times. Well, what was it? El Greco. You mean the artist? Well, that's what Stankowitz said. He's the officer who picked him up. Said he remembered he'd heard the name on that television quiz program. You know, the jockey who's the art expert. There. El Greco. Probably some Greek restaurant where he was bumming his meals. Now, you sure you want an autopsy, Sergeant? It's late. I won't get to, to it till tomorrow. All right. Take your time, Doc. There's, uh, there's something else, isn't there, Lou? Well, maybe, Mark. We found the old guy's room, and there was an ad thumbtacked over the sink. Nothing too unusual. Yeah? Here it is. Men and women wanted light work suitable for old people. No references required. Well, I checked it with the lieutenant. He says to forget it. He says it figures for an old guy to be interested in an ad like that. An old guy with $17,000 in cash? Yeah. Well, I didn't figure I'd argue with the lieutenant. Do you mind if I keep it? No. Go ahead. an old brownstone house in the East 80s. I got in line with the rest of the applicants. My face was lined with collodion wrinkles and I wore an antique shiny suit and run-down shoes. It was a good makeup job. I looked more authentic than the rest of the old-timers who were waiting for the interview. I finally came up to where a woman was asking the questions. Name? Kernit. Louis Kernit. Kernit. Mm-hmm. Address? Well, uh... I don't exactly have a place. I've been staying with a fellow down on 12th Street, a friend of mine. I met him in the cafeteria. Mm, previous occupation. Well, uh, I worked at a lot of things. Used to be a printer way back. I, I could uh, hand set... Uh, do you have any references? Uh, well... Family? Uh, no, 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 ma'am. I haven't got any family. I had a cousin in Salt Lake City, but I uh, haven't seen him in 30 years or more. The ad said you didn't need no references. Well, that's right. Uh, now, will you wait in the other room? Yes, ma'am. Do I get the job, ma'am? Just wait in the other room. I shuffled into the other room and sat down to wait. I concentrated on building a character for Louis Kernet. If I was going to carry this through, I was going to have to play a better performance than I'd ever given before. About half an hour, a young woman came into the room. I'd planned to be dozing the way an old man would, and so my eyes were closed when I heard the door close. When I opened them, I was looking into the barrel of a thirty-eight revolver. Are you awake now, Mr. Weldon? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think what? you need to carry on yeah. anymore. If you need any further convincing, you are Mark Weldon. You're about 40 years old, and you played this same character on television about six weeks ago. You played it fairly well. Thank you. Would you mind putting down that gun? Yes. Why did you apply for this position, Mr. Weldon? You're not old, not really. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, it was a bet. I was having an argument about the method with an actor who trained at the old Vic. I, 
I bet him that I could, uh, well, I could get by off the stage. With yeah, well, the don't same... bother. You've been very busy recently trying to find out why senile psychotics starve themselves to death. How did you know that? Well, I happen to know that you've been present at several police investigations into these cases, and you're a good friend of Sergeant Lou Pate. Well, you know a great deal more about me than I do about you. Well, I would be glad to enlighten you. My name is May Roberts. I'm the daughter of the late Dr. Anthony Roberts, the physicist who was dismissed from the Brookhaven Atomic Energy Laboratory five years ago. I assume you're connected with these starvation cases, or you wouldn't have known I was investigating them. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? I'm not afraid of professional detectives, Mr. Weldon. They deal only with facts. But I don't like amateurs. They guess too much. They don't stick to reality. Consequently, they're likely to get too close to the truth. Unfortunately, Miss Roberts, I'm nowhere near the truth. I haven't the slightest idea how you're tied in with those starvation Well, deaths. I intend to show you, Mr. Weldon. I'm happy to announce that you have the job. Now, look, Don't I... move, Mr. Weldon. Oh, incidentally, about 15 minutes ago, I called Sergeant Pate and told him I was your sister just in from Pittsburgh. I wanted to get in touch with you very badly, and Sergeant Pape was very sorry. He wished he could help me, but he didn't have the slightest idea where you were. All right, Mr. Weldon. Right ahead of you, please. Through that door. She didn't look like the kind of girl who would get to hold the gun on me as I went down the hall. So that's all I did, just go down the hall. I climbed up to the fourth floor to a large room. There was a maze of electrical equipment bolted down, tubes and wires and dials. In the middle of the room was a wire mesh cage. She kept that gun on me steady as a rock. She began to set readings on the dials and flip switches on the control panel. It'll take about five minutes for the field to build up, Mr. Weldon. Please get in the cathode area. You, you mean that wire cage? Go ahead. All right, all right. Now, I wouldn't advise moving now, Mr. Weldon. The wire carries some 10,000 volts. Now, look, Mr. Mr. Robert... Weldon, you're curious. And you could turn out to be a great nuisance to me. As long as you come this far, we might as well both benefit by it. Benefit? You'll find a suit of clothes on the floor there. Put it on. But after all... Put it on. I didn't know whether she was bluffing about the electric charge, but the revolver looked real enough, so I stripped and changed into the other clothes. The shoes were a little too tight and pointed. The collar of the shirt was too stiffly starched and too high under my chin... The suit was too narrow at the shoulders and at the ankles. I remember my father had a suit like that. The same shiny blue serge. All right. In your pocket, you'll find a set of envelopes. You'll find a set of instructions on each. Follow them carefully. I don't get it. You will. Use the envelopes in the order they are arranged. What's this all about? Mr. Weldon, I meant it when I said this could be a benefit to both of us. No use explaining anything. You'll find out. And don't try to escape. It can't be done. All right. Now the field generators are ready. Look, Miss Roberts, this is absolutely... Just follow instructions, Mr. Weldon. I blinked. I was standing outside a bank on a sunny day in spring. I stared at the people passing by. They were dressed like the characters in a 1930 movie. The women wore long dresses and flower pot hats. The men had hard straw hats, suits with narrow shoulders. The cars were square with flat radiators in the front. There was a trolley car passing by, and suddenly I realized that the last trolley car stopped running in Manhattan years ago. I tried to figure it out. It was New York, all right. I recognized some of the buildings. First, I figured it must have been hypnosis. And then I looked at the first of the envelopes in my pocket. I read it and walked into the bank. Yes, sir. Our Mr. Golden tells me that you wish to open an account. Yes, that, that's right. Uh-huh. Well, we're very happy to have a new depositor. Very happy indeed. Of course, you realize the institution is in sound condition. Very sound. You needn't worry about all those rumors in this bank. No, sir. Solid. Solid. Well, that, that's good. All right. Now, then, name... Mark Weldon, you have no address in the city at present? No, no. And you're depositing $150? That's right. All righty. I'll just check the slip here. $150, right. 
And the date, May 15th, of course, 1931. 31? The Depression. Oh, now, Mr. Weldon, this is a very good year for business. This temporary recession is bound to abate. Sound banking policies will see us through. It's just around the corner, you know. What? Uh, well, what is? Prosperity. All right, Mr. Weldon, we're very happy to have your account. I went outside the bank and I stood there in the spring sunlight and let the terror soak into me. The possibility of the entire situation was gnawing at the edges of my mind. And then suddenly I wasn't there. It was as fast as blinking. I was outside another bank in the same city. The date on the next envelope was May 29th, and it was still 1931. I made a $75 deposit there, and then $100 at another place a few days later, spending a few minutes each time and going ahead anywhere from a couple of days to almost a month. In 1934, I found myself inside a broker's office. Very well, Mr. Weldon. Um... As I understand it, you are buying this stock for a Dr. Anthony Roberts, hmm? That's right. I uh, assume the stock will be in his name? That's right. I'm, I'm just acting as agent. I, I follow instructions. Of course, of course. Well, are you sure I can't convince you that you're making a big mistake? No, no. These are my instructions. Well, now, Mr. Weldon, we are a reputable brokerage house, and, well, frankly, I feel quite shaky about putting our client's money into this kind of security. Uh, there's no future in it. It's a rare metal for which there is very little use for industrial purposes. And uh, Well, however, if your client is adamant... I have my instructions. Very well, then. In the name of Dr. Anthony Roberts, 100 shares of Montana uranium. Most unwise, most unwise... It went that way about 50-50. I'd deposit money in my own name in various banks at other times. Then I'd buy a stock or make a bet for May Roberts. On June 21, 1932, I bet Jack Sharkey to take the heavyweight title away from Max Schmeling. There was Singing Wood in 1933 at Belmont Park and Max Bayer over Primo Carnera. I went on skipping through the years, touching here and there for a few minutes to an hour at a time. It was in early October 1938... About five hours after I'd left May Roberts' house, before I realized what she had me doing, it was making deposits and winning sure bets, just as those senile psychotics had done. The ink on their bank book seemed fresh because it was fresh. It wasn't given a chance to oxidize. At the rate I was going, I'd be back at my own time in a few hours with $15,000 compound interest in cash. But those old people had died of starvation somehow with all that, that cash in banks. I didn't know how it happened or why. But suddenly it occurred to me that I didn't want to be found dead in my hotel room. So rather than make the deposit in 1938, I grabbed a cab and told the driver to step on it. I got a mile away from the bank, and then the cab suddenly disappeared. I found myself in front of a counter at a lunchroom. The envelope instructed me to make a bet on the World Series. There wasn't any way to get out of the range of the machine... It picked me up at least five miles away from where I was supposed to be. I came back a week later to get my winnings. I was hungry, so I got myself a hamburger and went out the door. When I hit the sidewalk, it happened again. Don't touch the cage yet, Mr. Weldon. I'll have to clear the charge. Hey, what happened to my hamburger? What? The hamburger. I had it here. It's gone. I'm hungry. I'll get you something to eat, Mr. Weldon, before your next trip. Well, <laughs> you've done pretty well for yourself, haven't you? Yes, yes, I have. About 15000 I, I had ketchup on my sleeve. It's gone. Mr. Weldon, I want to talk seriously with you. Now you've seen part of what I'm doing. Part? My father was discharged from all his research and university connections because he insisted in publishing his findings on the temporal field research. All the conventional physicists explained that it was overwork and recommended everything from hot bouillon before retiring to psychoanalysis. Well, possibly both of these might have been beneficial. But the fact of the matter is that temporal field activities are quite true, and you've seen proof. Well, I, I suppose I have. So it seemed just a question of money, although obviously I can get all I need now. But sending people back through time to bet on sure things like uranium... It's a fair exchange. I pay well for service, don't I? I suppose so. But that isn't the most important thing. 
I've been able to save things that would have been lost otherwise. I've sent people back to find precious treasures that would have been destroyed or would have disappeared. Like an El Greco painting? Yes. And the original score of Mozart's magic flute that would have been burned in 1942 and a Picasso miniature that would have been lost at sea in 52. I have them all here. Stolen? No. Bought with money from the year itself at a fair price. Well, Mr. Weldon, I sent you back because I've needed someone to work with me on a regular basis. Someone who's faster and more alert than the old people I've hired till now. Why old people? It's a function of the field. You can't send somebody back to a year in which they didn't exist at all. I'm hungry. Please, Mr. Weldon, this is very important. My father died trying to prove the validity of his field theory to conventional scientists. And I don't intend to bother. We can become the most powerful people in the world. I don't feel very powerful now. You haven't got a sandwich hanging around. I want to make you an offer, Mr. Weldon. I need someone to help me expand the operation, plan the projects and research. I chose you because I was afraid that you might hit on the truth by yourself. Can I come out of this cage Be careful. Now? Don't touch the contacts. The field reacts on a random factor for at least an hour after it's cut off. I'll be careful. Tell me, Miss Roberts, why haven't you been able to go back to the time that your father was alive and bring him back before he died? Dead tissue can't be transported. We tried it with mice and rabbits from a laboratory in 1941, and they just disappear. Like my hamburger. Mr. Weldon, I assume that you're interested and that we can make our plans without using this revolver. I hope so. $15,000 is a lot of money. Of course, you were able to send those old people back a lot further. (laughs) Some of them as far back as 1880. How long would they be gone? I mean, in subjective time. Several weeks. Perhaps a month, though, more. There's only one problem, Miss Roberts. Well, I'm, I'm sure we can work out any details. Well, this one is a little hard to work out. You see, I'm hungry. I haven't been this hungry since I got lost on a hunting trip and went without food for three days. You see, you forget I've got an interest in this business because they found some old people dead of malnutrition and $30,000 or so tucked away in their pockets. They had been gone a month or more, and they had to eat during that time, didn't they? And when they came back, the food disappeared like my hamburger. It disappeared all at once all over their body. In one fast jolt, they starved to death. No, no, you don't understand. They just couldn't take the field transition. They were too old, some of them, and they lied to me about their age to get the job. Oh, no, you can't tell me that because I know how hungry I am. And I was only gone about 12 hours. They were murdered. Get back. You know, they say a hungry man gets mighty desperate. He'll do almost anything. Let go. Let go. Let go of it. Oh. Oh. My arm. Look out. Look out. The cage. The contact. She fell into that cage and disappeared before she hit the ground. I didn't know what happened. I know she said the field worked in a random factor, whatever that meant. I called Lou Payton. He came to the house just after the fire started. Something went in the control panel, and it turned out to be a four-alarm fire before they got it under control. There was nothing left of the machine. There wasn't much left of the brownstone house. Lou didn't believe the story I told him. You mean there won't be any more of them? No more senile psychotics starving to death with a bankroll in their hip pocket? No, I told you, Lou. Come on now, Mark. We get plenty more. We always have. No, I'll bet you won't. I'll bet you a dollar there won't be another case like that. (laughs) I'll take that bet. I lost the bet. There was one more case. And perhaps it was the strangest one. A woman was found wandering in Bryant Park just before she died of acute starvation. One strange thing was she was young, not more than 30. And the other was she had $17,000 stuffed in her pocketbook and a bullet wound in her arm the medical examiner said was at least two months old. I guess that's what she meant by the random factor. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features This Way to the Regress by Damon Knight. 
The story of a man named Sullivan who, strangely enough, did not have a great future behind him, but rather a great past ahead. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. In a moment, tonight's cast and a preview of next week's exciting drama. Farmers know they can't stop storms, floods, or droughts from ruining a crop. But they can make sure things like that can't ruin them by investing in United States savings bonds. Not only farmers, but over 40 million Americans in all sorts of jobs own 40 billions of savings bonds. And why? Because savings bonds are the easy way to start saving and to keep saving. And the money you invest in savings bonds mean protection now and ready cash when you need it in the future. Improving the farm, sending the youngsters to college, or planning your own retirement. These are the big things you can be ready for with savings bonds. And besides offering you a safe investment, each Series E savings bond pays you back $4 at maturity for every three you invest. Yes, you earn extra dollars while you save, so start saving now. For the big things in your life, be ready with United States savings bonds. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Old Die Rich, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by H.L. Gold and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Jim Bowles, Jan Miner, Bill Zuckert, Guy Rep, Wendell Holmes, Ralph Camargo, and Ivor Francis. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Bob Maurer and is an NBC Radio Network production. In just a moment, X minus one, but first... A familiar theme that introduces some of the sweetest music this side of heaven. The music of Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians. And beginning Monday, July 30th, NBC Bandstand brings you live two full hours of your favorite tunes by Guy Lombardo, Tommy Dorsey, plus wonderful arrangements by Freddie Martin and Wayne King. It's four top bands in person joined by sparkling personalities like Burt Parks and Johnny Mercer, your Mr. Music. Remember, July 30th for the premiere of NBC Bandstand. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, The Stars Are the Sticks by Theodore Sturgeon. They call me Karen. It isn't my real name, but it suits my job. Karen, you may remember, ferried dead souls across the river sticks of Greek mythology. I ferried dead souls from the planet Earth out into the unknown of space. My little satellite station is known as Curbstone. I've been here for 20 years. Yes? Karen? Oh, tween. What is it? There's a ship landing from Earth. Is it the regular shuttle? Yes. Okay, we'll check the candidates as soon as they're in. I'll fill out the reports for you. Thank you. Oh, tween. Yes? Close the door a minute, will you? I want to talk to you. Yes? How long have you been here on Curbstone? Oh, I don't know. I think two years. Approximately. And you've been helping me here in the office for almost a year and a half. 
Have you thought about going back to Earth? Well, yes, I... I thought about it. And? Well, I couldn't. I... Well, I'd rather die. I just don't seem to belong there. You'd rather stay here and wait? Yes. Even though you may never become certified for space? One day it will happen. Perhaps. I almost hope it won't. Oh, don't say that. Well, the shuttle should be coming in soon. Maybe this trip there'll be somebody aboard for you. I have a feeling there will be. I suppose I ought to explain a little about Curbstone at this point. We're a stopping point. Well, a jumping off place would be more accurate. We get people from Earth who, for many reasons, cannot remain there. Some are antisocial, criminals of a sort. Some are misfits, individualists who cannot adjust to the rigid standardization. Some are just different. People who are physically different and who have been ostracized as a result. And a few are poets. Those who have souls too big for the confines of Earth. They come to Curbstone and wait to be certified for space. And it's my job to send them out. They're waiting. How many of the strip? Two men and a woman. One of the men... Yes? Nothing. Oh, I've known you too well to be fooled. Why, you're practically glowing. <laughs> Did you speak to him? No. But you think perhaps he'll be the one to choose you? Well, I think perhaps... The way he looked at me. Oh. Well, he didn't think there was anything funny about me. He just looked. There is nothing funny about you. Oh, you're trying to be kind. You should know me better. I'm the original Billy Goat Gruff. Oh, I do know you better. You have a kind heart. Enough of that. Ask him to come in. One at a time. <laughs> I watched her walk to the door, and I thought she was beautiful. She was, but not in a way acceptable to the eugenics department back on Earth. Tween was an albino. She had silver skin and hair and ruby-colored eyes. If I hadn't been such an old fat fool. This way, please. Uh, thank you. This is the senior release officer. He'll check you in. Thank you, miss. Your name, please. Well, don't you know it? No, I'm afraid I... Judd! Good Lord. Hello, friend. <laughs> Judson, after all these years. I understand they call you Karen. Yes. <laughs> oh, good, I'll call you Karen. Well, what in the name of misery brings you to Curbstone? Oh, I'm a candidate. But you, of all people, you had a, a good position and enough money. You didn't get into trouble, did you? Oh, the sort. Of what sort? When I was your student at the university many years ago, you taught me to enjoy my individuality. Huh. I tried to teach my students the same thing. The authorities wouldn't stand for it. I see. So I decided to take my chances in space. Are you aware of the risk? Well, not fully, or I probably wouldn't be here. Well, then let me acquaint you with the procedure here on Curbstone. Look out that window. What do you see? It looks like a spaceship on a launching platform. Exactly. That ship is aimed at the outer galaxies. It has enough fuel to reach its destination and land, but not enough to come back. I see. The people who come here to Curbstone have to be certified before they can take off in one of those ships. Well, how does one go about being certified? There are three requirements. You must pass a physical examination and a mental examination. Uh -huh. And the third? You must find an agreeable partner for the trip. A partner? A partner of the opposite sex who is willing to share her life or death with you from now until eternity. Well, that could be rather difficult. When the Earth authorities agreed to Operation Curbstone, it was decided that it would be a method of colonizing the outer galaxies with Earth people. Therefore, these ships are built to carry two people. I see. Well, suppose I choose somebody and she doesn't want me. You wait. Suppose, I just suppose, I pass the physical and the mental tests and I even find a partner. Suppose we get into the ship and are launched into space. Now, what are our chances? Come here. This board shows a light for each ship that is en route in space. There, you see that one? That's a couple named Fort and Mary Ellen. They went out together last week, headed for the Deneb systems. 
As long as the light shows, they're all right. They haven't been destroyed by radiation or piled up on some asteroid or gotten into a time warp. We know from our years of launching couples here on Curbstone that 46% of them never make it. And of those that make it? We don't know. They have the equipment for survival, of course, but who knows what they'll meet on some strange planet. And still they go out, huh? Still they go out. When do I take the examinations? Well, you can start tomorrow if you like. I'd like to talk over old times with you right now, but I have to check the other two passengers you came up with. Uh, certainly. Now, Tween, would you come in, please? Tween assists me here. She, too, is waiting to find a partner for the trip. Yes? Now, Tween, this is Judson. Judson's an old friend. He was a student of mine many years ago. I'm very happy to meet you. Yes, I know you are. Uh, Tween, tell the others to come in, please. Yes, sir. A remarkable girl. Remarkable looking, at any rate. Well, uh, Tween will tell you where your quarters are. I hope we'll talk soon. Well, I hope so. Oh, by the way, yeah. that light on the board, uh, Fort and Mary Ellen? What about it? Well, it, it just went out. I was happy to see Judson. My memories of our association were pleasant ones. As he left, the other two passengers came in. The man was young, dark-haired, and slick-looking. His name was Wald. The woman, well, she takes some describing. Her name was Flower. Her voice was like a cello. And her figure was a walking demand for the revival of the now-extinct profession of Peeping Tom. Let me be honest. I didn't like either of them. That takes care of your documents. How long will it take us to be certified? Well, that depends. If you pass your test, it can happen in a week. And suppose we don't pass our tests. You might be here a year, two years. There's no limit. <laughs> you, uh, you can keep taking the test, or you can return to Earth. Earth? Oh. Well, is there anything to do up here? I mean, excitement. That depends on what you consider excitement. Anything we haven't already tried. Isn't that right, Wald? We decided to come up here, Mr... Uh... Call me Karen. Karen. How quaint. Anyway, we decided to come up here because we were bored with the routine on Earth. You're aware of the risk involved? You mean we might not make it? <laughs> well, that's life, isn't it? Well, for some. For others, it's death. I don't like that kind of talk. You'll attend an orientation session tomorrow. I'll have my assistant show you to your quarters. <sighs> Twin. Yes? Come in, Twin. I want you to meet Flower. How do you do? And Wald. Well... Curbstone is exciting already. Something different, darling? Oh, shut up. This is Tween. She'll show you where you live. Oh, a pleasure. A distinct pleasure. There was something decadent about Wald and Flower, something almost reptilian. I couldn't believe that these two would ever step into a ship and risk the trip to space. Of course, I could be wrong. Boredom drives people to risk many things. At the session the next day, I watched my three new arrivals. When it was over, I stood talking to Judson. Well, still want to go out? Yes. You got a companion yet? Oh, yes. Really? Well, you haven't met anybody yet. I've met the person I'd like to go with. Mind if I ask who? Your assistant, Tween. <laughs> you don't disappoint me, Jed. I fell in love with her the first time I met her, too. I haven't even <laughs> talked to her yet, except to say hello and where's the commissary, but there's, but there's a quality about her like, well... I... Like a cool breeze on a hot summer's day. Well, you are smitten. At my age, I can afford to be romantic. Oh, excuse me, am I interrupting? Not at all. Judson, you know, Flower. Yes, we met on the ship coming to Curbstone. I wondered if you were busy. For me? You. Well, not really, no. Good. Then you can take me down to the recreation room for some methyl caffeine. Well, I don't use it. That doesn't mean you can't take me. Well, you're Mr. Wald. Oh, I mean... Wald and I are just very good friends. Besides, he's busy right now. He's being shown around the satellite by this gentleman's assistant. Twin? That's her name. The peculiar one. Coming, Judson? I guess so. You excuse us? Certainly. When I saw Tween the next day, 
There were stars in her eyes. Good morning. Good morning. You're laughing. Am I? Your eyes are. I'm happy. Good. <laughs> I think it won't be long now. Before what? Before I'm certified. Oh? I've met someone who really likes me. I see. Can you guess? No. Who is it? Well, you know the dark-haired young man who came in yesterday with your friend Judson? Wald? Mm-hmm. We went down to the ship together, and he... Well, he asked a lot of questions about it, and, and then we started to talk about us. He says he's wasted his whole life flitting from one diversion to another. Really? Now he says... He's looking for something with some meaning. You like him? Well, he isn't afraid of me. He doesn't see anything wrong with my being different. I thought he was with Flower. Oh, he says he and Flower travel together because of habit. They're both bored and looking for something. Or someone. Well, as long as it makes you happy. He... He kissed me. Do you know that... No man has ever kissed me like that. You enjoyed it? Oh, yes. Did he say anything about going out into space with you? He said he could think of no one he'd rather go with. And uh, when is he going to sign the certification? Well, um, he felt we ought to get to know each other better. For a while, anyway. He's right, don't you think? Yes, I, I think it would be better. Karen. Yes? I love you very much. Why did you say that? Well, because it's true. I mean, well, there's something so kind and understanding about you. And don't let it fool you. Underneath, I'm the same as anybody else. No, I don't believe it. Why, well, they picked you for this job because you... Well, you have such compassion. You could never hate. Could you? I, I don't know. I never have, but... Well, now I don't know. That's because you're in love. You can't love, really, unless you can hate. Oh, I don't believe that. Oh, <laughs> I just invented it to sound as if I knew the answers. <laughs> Come on, I'll buy you a drink to celebrate the big event. I watched her sip the drink, the tones of her skin coming and going with the pulse of her blood. I thought to myself, you're going to be hurt, twin. You're going to be terribly, terribly hurt. And I wondered if perhaps she didn't know it. Well, twin, another couple out into space. Maria and Clint. Will you record it and have another ship brought up to the launcher? Uh, twin. What? Oh, sorry, I, I was thinking of something else. Wald? So it have. How long has it been now? Three months. Long time, huh? Well, I... Well, he wants to be sure. And you? Are you sure? Oh, yes. Nothing to do but wait, then. I have to go over to the hull division. Will you take over? Yes. Well, sometime I, too, will be speeding through space. And I'll be a tiny light on this board. Hello there. Mind if I come in? Oh, not at all. Where's Fatso? Karen? Oh, he isn't that fat. No, he's fat enough. Where is he? He went over to the hull division. Well, this is a nice layout. Did you come to see me or the layout? You know I came to see you. Matter of fact, I wanted to talk to you about something. Well? The party tonight at the rec center. Well, what about it? We're going, aren't we? I can't make it. Was something wrong? I'm meeting somebody else. Oh. Flower. I see. Oh, come on. I don't look so hurt. Flower and I have bummed around together for years. But I thought she and Judson... Oh, don't be ridiculous. Well, they spend all their time together. Oh, you don't know Flower. She likes to experience new things. When they get to be old, she tosses them away. <laughs> all except me. A and you? Do you like to experience new things and toss them away? Look, I'm sorry, Tween, but uh, it's just the way I am. Like flower. Like flower. We're two of a kind. Would you do me a favor? Why not? Make it a clean break. Don't try to see me again or, or tell me any more lies, even though I want to hear them. 
Okay. And thanks. Thanks? For these three months, even though they've been make-believe, at least I've had them. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see you around. Yeah, I'll see you around. Hey. Oh, Karen. Karen. Oh, no. Just let him flow. He doesn't care about me. He never has. I know. And he's going back to Flower. I know. I saw him leaving. Oh, what'll I do? He's the only one who ever wanted me. No. Not the only one. Now there are two of us. The question that kept going through my mind was, what next? How long was Wall going to hang around Curbstone before he decided to go back to Earth? I couldn't believe he'd have the guts to go out into space. But I had underestimated Flower. Well, well, the prodigal returns. Don't make funny remarks. Uh, tell me, darling, what brings you to my room at this late hour? Could it be that you miss me? Or has little Miss Tween given you the heave? Oh, shut up and give me a drink. <laughs> And don't act so self-righteous. You've been having your fling with this Judson character. My, my. Jealous, too. Oh. I thought you and I agreed a long time ago we'd never make any claims on each other. That was a long time ago. Frankly, I'm getting bored with the satellite. Let's go back to Earth. I'm bored with Earth. Well, we'll go someplace else, then. I am going someplace else. Where? Out. Space. <laughs> Oh, come on, now, don't be ridiculous. Oh, I am not being ridiculous. Do you know that only 46% arrive? And if you get there, heaven only knows what kind of monsters or poison atmospheres get you. I know, but there's a certain thrill in the risking. Oh, and when did you start feeling poetic? Since I started talking to Judson. Listen, Flower, don't try to trick me. I know you too well. You're 100% too selfish to risk your pretty skin for some poetic feeling. Well, listen to me. You and I have been together for years. We're very much alike. Now I'm telling you that I intend to go out. I want you to sign my certification and come with me. You're mad. No, no. I think maybe if we get away from everything out there, we'll find each other. Oh. We'll have a chance to love and be decent like ordinary human beings. Oh, Walt, well, don't you see? We've been destroying ourselves for years. We're getting older now. Oh, please. Please try to see it. A clean start, a new life, huh? Well, this fella Judson has really been filling your ear, hasn't he? He's a kind person. He doesn't think I'm a... Well, worthless. <laughs> you kill me, girl. Walt, will you come with me? No, no. If you want to wreck yourself, go ahead. And who, pray tell, thinks enough of a cheap character like you to sign her certification? Judson. What? He said he would go out with me. And I intend to go. I certified Judson and Flower that same evening. They were going to leave at midnight. I was working late. Come in. Well, Flower, I thought you and Judson... We're not going. At least, I'm not. Oh? Judson decided he didn't want me along. He did? Here. He left this note for me. <laughs> the story of my life. Nice girl, but who wants to marry anybody like that? Let me see. I'm going alone. Don't try to stop me. It wouldn't work. I'd always look down on you, Judson. It doesn't sound like him. Sounds like every man I've ever known. Except Wald. Wald doesn't judge me. Except Wald. Where's Judson now? Locked in the ship. He's leaving at midnight. Three minutes. Listen, you wait here. Where, where are you going? To see if I can reach that ship before it's too late. A man of my size and age shouldn't run. Especially when he has a bad valve in his heart. But I covered the distance to the takeoff ramp like a track star. As I hit the edge of the ramp, I heard Tween's voice screaming at me from the control tower. Just the rockets were beginning to warm up inside the ship. There wasn't any way to get in except the blast. The 
There's only one way to stop a ship from taking off once the combustion chambers are operating. You have to get the dampening rods into the chambers and stop the chain reaction. I took a lot of beef, but I've got a lot. <sighs> I looked around the control room of the ship. Judson was strapped into the pilot's chair. The controls were preset for automatic takeoff. I went over to him. He was dead. His head cracked like an eggshell. Judd, I know you can't hear me. But I swear to you, I'll get the one who did this. Really? Don't move. I have a gun on you. Wald, you're a pig. You're a living human pig. Thanks for the compliment. To take the life of a man whose only act against you was that he wanted to help Flower? I can't afford to lose Flower. Don't you think you've lost her already? Not at all. She thinks Judson is going out into space without her. Oh, I knew he wasn't capable of writing a note like that. It doesn't matter. Just how do you expect to get away with this? Quite easily. Judson isn't going out alone after all. Meaning? He's going to have a companion. You. It won't work, Walt. Once this ship is headed for the stars, there won't be a shred of evidence. Okay. You've got it all figured out. That's right. Now turn around. You have the gun. All I've got is this. Stop it. Drop it. <laughs> Fat men can move amazingly fast, Walt. What are you going to do? Do? Nothing much. I'm just going to certify you, Walt. What? For a flight into space. things you can do to a man if you know enough physiology. Pressures on the nerve system that can immobilize him for hours. I did them to Wald. Then I set the controls of the ship again and went out. I was breathing hard. It took me a long time to make it up the steps of the control tower where Tween was waiting. I was so worried. I, I thought you'd be burned. And then when Wall went I'm in... I'm okay. Just let me sit down a minute. What uh, happened? Nothing much. I had to stop Judson from leaving alone, that's all. But why? Well, Wall decided to leave with him. What? That's right. He finally repented. He, uh, he knew that if he stayed around, he'd just make you unhappy again and... So he asked me to stop Judson until he could join him. You mean he did... Any second now. There go the engines. He had a spark of decency in him after all. I knew it. Yes. In a way, he's a sort of hero. The ship is trembling now. There they go. Maybe she knew, maybe not. Anyway, she had loved a man, and now she could love another. She came over to me and leaned over and kissed my mouth. Her lips were cool. Then I knew that I could live with the viciousness of what I had done. When you're old and fat as I am, the kiss of a young girl can make you human again. They call me Karen. They forget what it feels like to be denied two worlds instead of one. And they forget something else, too. Karen was more than a boat pilot. He was an executioner. <laughs> You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company 
in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features a story by Theodore Sturgeon, The Other Man, which tells of the hardest decision a man could face, to do his job well and thereby aid his bitterest enemy. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight by Transcription X-1 has brought you The Stars of the Sticks, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by H.L. Gold and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Craig McDonnell, Patsy O'Shea, Dick Hamilton, Charlotte Manson, and Bob Hastings. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Bob Maurer and is an NBC Radio Network production. The music of Freddie Martin, live weekday morning starting Monday on NBC Radio. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X, 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 X minus, 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 minus one... one, one, one. Tonight, Student Body by F.L. Wallace. Our story in one minute. Girl. Boy. Moon. June. Ring. Wedding. Home. Money. Baby. Money. Education. Money. Retirement. Money. Solution. United States Savings Bonds. There's a smart couple. They're looking to the future. They know how important it is to plan for the future now with savings bonds. Yes, the plans you make today will determine what kind of tomorrow you have. Are you a student? Are you a young married couple? Are you approaching the golden years? Whatever your age, whatever your situation, savings bonds can be a big help in making your tomorrow secure and happy. Plan wisely. Buy savings bonds regularly where you work or where you bank. They're a good investment. You're saving your money and you're earning more. Series E bonds pay 3% interest compounded twice a year when the bonds are held to maturity. And savings bonds are as safe and sound as America itself. What's more, they're protected against loss or theft. For the big things in your life, be ready with United States Savings Bonds. And now, Student Body by F.L. Wallace. Emergency report to Central Colonial Service, subject Planet 7G63, Glade. Reporting, Dano Marin. Special assignment from Biological Control. Report consisting of standard universal tapes and special recorded comment. First segment, landing day, plus one. 6 a.m. sidereal mean time. Voices on tape, myself, Colonial Executive Shep Hafner, and Athiel, a female member of our crew. Tape commencing. <laughs> Watch your step on the ramp, Marin. It's tilted. Oh, yes, I will, I will. All right, where, where, where are these people? Over there, a few hundred feet. Beneath that tree. Oh, well, come on, then. You know, I'm going to have to note in the log that you cleared the planet for colonization as of last night. I understand. I'm taping this now for my records. I take full responsibility for the safety of this planet. All right. But wait until you see this. Here we are. Now, do you see there? In the clearing beneath that tree? What? Good Lord, they haven't a stitch of clothes on. None of them. That's just what I told you. Are they all right? They're not... They're no, not... no. No, they're just asleep. 
You can see them breathing. Look here, Hat. Now, who gave them permission to sleep out here in the open? Shh, don't wake them yet. I gave them permission, Marin. They've been cooped up in that ship for over six months. They wanted to sleep outside. And in view of your clearance, I couldn't see any reason to refuse permission. I know, I know. You were within your rights. But the clothing, why, they, they, they don't even have blankets. They did have, when they bedded down last night. Some of them even used the standard issue sleeping bag. Well, then what happened to them? There are 13 people sleeping around that tree, and they're stark naked, all of them. Last night, you told me there was nothing dangerous on Glade. Do you still think so? I know so. I have the complete biological survey. Does your survey account for anything like this? You know it doesn't. That's what I thought. Okay. Now you've seen it for yourself. Let's wake them up and get them back to the ship. No, wait. You better wake them one at a time. This will be embarrassing enough for them as it is. Yes, I suppose you're right. I will wake the nearest one first. That's a Thiel, our lab technician. Yes, well, here, take my jacket. Cover her with it before you wake her. All right. Wake up, Athiel. <laughs> All right, Athiel, wake up. It's Executive Hatton. What? Oh, what is it? I am sorry, Athiel. Something has happened. Oh, my clothes. My, 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 my blanket. Everything's gone. Now, now, be careful. Don't, don't wake the others. Oh, oh yeah, yes, the others. Why, good heavens, they're all that Ethel, way. Athiel, just go back to your cabin on the ship. Everything is all right. We'll explain it to you when we have the others safely back. Well, I feel so, oh, so foolish. How could this happen? What's the meaning of now, it? Now, just get back to the ship. Your clothes back there are perfectly safe. Yes, it's all right. I... Well, thank you. Hmm. You told her we'd explain it later, Hafner. Do you think we can? That's your job, isn't it? This planet is as new to me as it is to you. You're the biologist. What destroyed their clothing? It would have to be something that could destroy both blankets and clothing without waking the people. Nocturnal insects? Ordinarily, I'd say that was a distinct possibility if it weren't for the fact that our surveys show no evidence whatsoever of any such insects on Glade. Your survey could have missed them, couldn't it? Not if they existed in any great quantity. Besides, if insects were the answer, there should be some kind of evidence of them right here in the area where Athiel was lying. Certainly one or two of them would be crushed when she rolled over in her sleep. Well, that sounds reasonable. Now, well, look for yourself. There's absolutely no sign of anything at all here. Well, what about some chemical, some vapor oozing from the ground? No chance at all. I'd rule that out completely. Then what? Well, here's the tree itself. I suppose it could exude some sort of a chemical that might dissolve cloth, but I can check that in the lab. Well, we'd better arouse the rest of these people and get them back to the ship. Hey, wait, wait. What? What is it? Why, it's some kind of an animal. Hmm? Just caught a glimpse through there. Ah, there he is. Yeah, you see behind that bush? Yeah. Looks almost like a chipmunk. Yes, and he's feeding on something. Why, it, it, it looks like a piece of cloth. Marin, do you think that... Shh, he doesn't hear us. I'll just ease up to him now. Closer. Closer. Now. You got him. Oh! Oh, well, hit you, you little devil. Watch out, Marin. He's got sharp teeth. <laughs> You're telling me. Easy there, boy. Easy. Yeah, like to have your head stroked? Ah, sure you do. That's the boy. He's calming down. Yes, look at that. Ah, he's nestling in the crook of my arm, almost, almost like a kitten. Almost. Marin, I hope you don't mind short sleeves. Now, what do you mean? He's already eaten half the sleeve off your shirt. I think we've found the answer to our problem. The animal was a small furry mammal resembling an Earth-type rodent. Its overall length is 14 centimeters, weight 512 grams. Fur stringy and sparse, color a light beige, indicating no particular protective coloring. The animal was placed in a special cage in a biological laboratory aboard ship for further study. Next tape, landing date plus two. Can we exterminate it? Ah, oh, it's quite a job. How about locally? Hardly. It's ecologically basic. Look, Marin, you're from biological control. I've just got an executive's rating. Well, look, you know how control works. They send a survey ship over and record the neural currents of the animals. They get everything that has a brain, including insects, and they take a few specimens to check the patterns. Now, here's the report on Glade. The survey shows that this animal is 
one of only four species of mammals on the planet. It is also the most numerous. So if we kill them off here, others will swarm in from other areas? Yes, that's about it. There are <laughs> probably millions of them around the planet. Of course, if you want to put a barrier across the connection to the mainland, you might be able to wipe them out locally. Look, Marin, I've got a tight schedule. I can't spare dirt-moving equipment for that. By the way, what do they eat? Well, as far as I can see, anything. Insects, fruit, berries. You could call it an omnivora. Now that our clothing is handy, it eats that, too. I thought our clothing was supposed to be vermin-proof. It is. On 27 planets, on the 28th, we met up with a little fella that has better digestive fluids, that's all. Right. He's eating a leather belt right now. Yeah. Are they likely to bother the crops we plant? They shouldn't, but uh, then I would have said the same thing about our clothing. All right, Marin, you worry about the crops. Find some way to keep them out of the fields. Meanwhile, everyone sleeps inside the ship until we can build dormitories. Biological examination of omnivorae posed this question. Why only four species of mammals on Glade? No reptiles and only a few birds. On all comparable planets, a large variety of species. Nearest Earth parallel, fossil remains from the late Carboniferous show creatures like the omnivora, but on Glade there appears to be no further evolution. Next tape segment, L plus 22, place, temporary warehouse, quartermaster Crone, and myself. There you are, Mr. Marin. They got in every seat, sack, and barrel in this part of the warehouse. Well, what makes you think it's mice? Look, I've worked in grain elevators for 30 years in Kansas. Look the way that sack is gnawed. And look over there, droppings. Well, it's not exactly... I know, I know, so they're mice-like. I want to know how to get rid of them. Have you tried poison? You tell me what poison to use, and I'll use it. They got into a hundred-pound sack of arsenic and went through it like it was whipped cream. Well, how did they get in? It's a fused dirt floor, isn't it? It should be pestite. But see, there are cracks along here. They must have burrowed through. They were loose in here, and we don't have time to build another warehouse. They've got to be controlled here. Well, catch me a few of them alive, and I'll see what I can do. Next morning, a dozen live specimens of mice-like mammals were delivered to the lab. No two of them were affected by the same poison and the poison developed to control the omnivora was completely ineffective. Alternate discussed with Executive Hafner and Machinist Tully of Computer Engineering. Next tape, L plus 24. Hafner, Tully, and myself. I tried it out yesterday, Mr. Hafner. I think I've got all the bugs licked now. Tully, I don't want any more metal used than is necessary. This isn't standard authorized equipment. You're not dealing with a standard authorized problem. Are you ready to activate the device? Sure thing. Here, help me get it down from this assembly bench down on the floor. All right. There you go, kitty. Now, what do you think of her? A robot cat. Well, I still think we need at least three of them. Mr. Marin, inventory on colonial expeditions is always short. One will have to do. All right, Tully. Show us how this mechanical mouse catcher operates. You better get out of the way, Mr. Marin. If you've touched any of the mice in the lab, she'll go for you. She reacts to smell as well as sight and sound. All right, Tully, start it up. <laughs> All right, Kitty, go ahead and have a good time. Why, she, she moves like a cat. You know, I wouldn't bet a plug nickel on any mouse in the same warehouse with that baby. Robot cat device proved relatively successful in warehouse one. Rodent damage held below danger margin. Next tape, L plus 37. Tully, Hafner, and myself. I can't salvage it, Mr. Hafner. Just look at that. That skeleton was chrome steel. Now it's bent. The skin was duroplastic, and now it's cut to ribbons. The computer parts are all smashed to bits. How do you account for it, Tully? Well, look around the poor thing. You had me build it for mice. These things weren't mice. They're a, they're a good foot long. They just outnumbered him, that's all. You examined these dead animals, Marin? Not closely. Well, you'll find your mice have grown. They ganged up on that cat. There aren't supposed to be any rats on Glade, are there? Well, there weren't supposed to be any mice either. What are you going to do? We'll have to build another warehouse. Two foot thick fused floors. Wait a minute, Mr. Hafner. To do that, we'll have to stop all the other construction. The atomic generator Why not won't... build more robot cats? You weren't here when we opened the doors, Marin. A warehouse was swarming with rats. Tully, how many robot cats would we need? Five? 
Fifteen. We don't have enough parts to build more than three. If we need more than that, we'll have to rob the computer in the spaceship. And that's one thing I refuse to do. The spaceship is our only link with Earth until the next wave in two years. All right, then I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll flood light the supplies at night. We'll post the guard with half-charged rifles until we can move to the new warehouse. That'll take about ten days. Meanwhile, our fast crops are ripening. It's my guess that the rats will turn to that for food. Now, in order to protect our future food supplies, you'll have to activate your cold storage animals, Mr. Marin. Hafner, it's against regulations to release any cold storage animals on a planet until after a complete investigation. That takes 10 to 20 years. This is an emergency. I don't want to be responsible for another rabbit-infested Australia or that planet in the Centauri system that the snails took over. Marin, I'll take the responsibility. You're recording now, aren't you? Yes. All right. If that isn't authorization enough, I'll put it in writing. Well, the beast I've got for this job won't be any good against rats this size. You've got hormones. Use them. Dead rats were gathered and frozen for further study. Observed animals, a wide variation in size. Internally, a lack of uniformity in organs. Some specimens had huge fangs and delicate jaws. Others had tiny teeth and massive bone structure. Obviously, the most scrambled species ever encountered by a biologist... Reproductive cells were especially baffling. Proceeding with hormone treatment on cold storage earth animals. Next tape, L plus 39. Lab technician, Athiel, and myself. First one is coming out of it, Mr. Marin. Yes, that makes 85% viability. That's not bad. Uh, uh, all right, fella, now, take it easy, take it easy. Oh, he's a cute little fella. But he's tough. That's a wire-haired terrier. They're small, but they've been used for ratters since the Middle Ages. Mm. You think he's nearly ready for the hormone course? I think so. All right, first pituitary injection. Ready. All right, now, this is going to hurt just a little, fella. Oh, yeah, it's a dirty trick, isn't it, jabbing you with a needle when you're fresh out of the deep freeze? But don't you worry, fella. You'll be glad you had it. You'll stand a better chance against those rats when we work you up to about a Great Dane size. L plus 50. Artificially enlarged terriers loosed in the fields of the fast crops. Following tape, field observation of terriers. Executor Hapner and myself. How long have they been at it, Marin? Oh, since daybreak. I have to bring the dogs in at night and shoot them full of antibiotics. Will the dogs last? Well, this crop will be harvested in about a week. We'll make that. And there'll be two weeks to rest up before the next fast crop shows above ground. I think we've got the rats licked for a while. Well, when you get a chance, you might ask some of those PhDs in Central how they happened to hand us a survey and forgot to give us a few details like mice and rats. I have been checking on that, Mr. Hafner. I don't think there's any doubt. When that survey was made before we landed, there weren't any mice and rats on glade. Then where did they come from? How did they get here? I don't know. But we're going to have to find out. Research project on pseudo-mice and pseudo-rats interrupted by field trip with biological survey officer Whitehead. Tape L plus 63 in field geological survey vehicle. Whitehead and myself. You think you got troubles? Can you read a sonar map? No. Here, look. See this scope? It reads straight down about 10 miles. I'm supposed to be out looking for oil shale, but I got kind of interested in this. Look. First few feet down, you can find fossils. After the first few feet, that's about 20,000 years... There are no fossils until you get way down here. That's about the same as late Carboniferous on Earth. Then you get the fossils again. It doesn't figure. But isn't that usual, changes in geological eras? You don't get it, man. I'm not talking about eras. I'm talking about years. Straight down from here, 20,000 years ago, this was a desert. And then three years later, it was a jungle. Five years after that, there was a glacier. Earth normal would be 50,000 years or more for a change like that. Mm, what caused it? Here you've got me. Fluctuations in the sun, I don't know, but talk about changeable weather. This planet really has it. Based on accumulated data, theory developed regarding mammalian life on planet Glade. Tape L plus 65, place temporary headquarters of Executive Hafner. 
Marin, I've got a lot of work to clear up this morning. I thought you might like to know where the mice came from. They don't bother us anymore. I have also determined the origin of the rats. They're under control. I wonder if they are, Mr. Hafner. What do you mean? Mr. Hafner, I've checked this with Whitehead. Between 100 million years and 20,000 years ago, this planet was changing violently and quickly. The first change wiped out the dinosaur just the way it did on Earth. But it kept on changing. Desert, glacier, jungle... And all this within the lifespan of a single animal. For one million years, this was the norm of existence on Glade. I've checked geological survey. The planet is stable now. Well, that's not what I'm getting at. The point is, survival was difficult. Only one species of mammals managed to come through. Now, wait a minute, Marin. There are four species, ranging in size from a squirrel to a water buffalo. One species. They're the same. If the food supply for the largest animal increases, some of the smaller so-called species just grow up. Conversely, if the food becomes scarce in any category, the next generation, which apparently can be produced almost instantly, switches to a form which does have an adequate food supply. The mice? The mice weren't here when we got here. They were born of the squirrel-sized omnivora. And the rats? Born of the next larger size. After all, we are environment, too, and they adapt to environment. Let me get this straight. The mutations... On Earth, it would be mutation. Here, it's merely normal evolution. These animals have no genes or chromosomes. I don't know how they pass down heredity, but they react to external conditions far faster than anything we've ever encountered. Then we'll never be free from pests unless, of course, we rid the planet of all animal life. Yeah, you mean with radioactive dust? That won't work. They've survived worse. Oh, maybe we could leave the planet. Leave it to the animals. I could exercise authority under Clause 364. It's too late for that. What do you mean? We sent back the specimen ship. The animals are on Earth, too. But those specimens were in cages. Yes, but the next generation would be small enough to get out through the bars. They'll be running free in the cargoes of the spaceships. They'll land on Earth, and the first thing you know, a new mutation of rats will appear. They won't have any reason to connect it with the specimens from Glade. They won't be able to vermin-proof every building on Earth. No, we've got to stay here. We've got to study the animals here and find out how to beat them. If we can. Next tape, L plus 83. Place, field outpost. Quartermaster Crone, Hafner, and myself. I saw it, Mr. Hafner. I saw it. Are you sure? There. Do you see that tree? No, no, the big one. The white flowers? That's the one. I saw it behind there. Can you describe it? Well, I didn't get a good... That's it. That's what I heard. It sounds like a tiger. I've heard them like that in India. You watch. Right by that tree. Hey, look out, look out. It's, it's heading this way. Give me that rifle. Hurry up. Shoot. Shoot. <laughs> Try again. That got it. Come on. Come on, let's take a look. Now look out. It might be still alive. No, no, I hit it square with that second charge. What in the devil is it? It's a good eight feet long. What do you make of it, Marin? Well, except for the lack of markings, it closely resembles a tiger. Look at those claws. We chase the rats out of the warehouse, they go to the fields. We hunt them down in the fields with dogs and they breed tigers. Well, that's easier than rats. We can shoot tigers. Wait a minute. We've been here less than three months, Marin. The dogs have been in the fields only two. And that tiger's mature. How do you account for that? I am not sure, Mr. Hapner, but I imagine if the survival factor is high, the young don't ever have to be young. What? They can be born as fully functioning adults. Development report. Mice under control. Field rats under control by terriers. Tiger-like animals under control with searchlight and rifle. Additional complication. The original animal developed an appetite for electrical insulation. There is no protection except to keep the power on at all times. The last tiger-like animal was seen at L plus 130. After that, the attack ceased. By L plus two years, the animal seemed to have been controlled in all its forms. However, three months before the next colonists were due, a new animal was detected. Food was missing from the fields. Dogs were useless. The animals seemed to roam the fields and the dogs did not attack. Patrols were unable to find the animal. Tape L plus two years. Hafner, Engineer Tully, and myself. 
Now, here's the way I'm rigging it up, Mr. Hafner. Whatever it is, it spotted the photoelectric cell rig. So I've worked up an alarm that reacts to body radiation. You're sure the animal won't spot that? Well, I'm burying it in the field. Then we'll move the visible alarms to another field. All right, Tully. As soon as the alarm goes off, notify Mr. Marin and me. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Just as soon as the alarm goes off. L2 plus 15. Radiation alarm sounded. Place, field station, Hafner and myself. Look out where you're walking, Marin. We don't want to scare it away. Well, there are dogs in that field, aren't there? Well, there were supposed to be, but they didn't bark. Quiet. There, there it is. See? See? Huh? It's in between the rows. Look out. Look out. Give me a clear shot. No, wait a minute. Don't shoot. Look, Marin, I'm the executive here. I say it's dangerous. Dangerous? That's why you can't shoot. It's more dangerous than you know. Quiet, quiet. It'll hear you. We're downwind. Now, listen, Hafner. This is important. I don't want any lecture now, Marin. I don't want to lose the shot. You've got to listen. That animal could evolve mice. We stopped mice and it brought rats. We turned back the rat and provided the tiger. All right, we stopped the tiger. Not really. There was another animal being formed. The one that's in that field now. It took the animal two years to create it. How, I don't know. A million years were required to evolve it on Earth. He's moving away. Marin, I'm going to shoot. Don't shoot. We can't destroy the animal. It's on the Earth now and on other planets. We've never even been able to get rid of our own rats. How can we exterminate this animal? All the more reason to start now. Get down and give me a clear shot. Listen. Are their rats better than ours? Will their beasts win or ours be stronger? Or will the two make peace, unite, and interbreed? It's not impossible. This animal could do it if interbreeding had a high survival factor. Don't you see? After the tiger, they, they, they bred this thing. If we shoot it down, what will come next? Look at it, standing erect. Opposable thumbs, binocular vision, a large brain capacity. This one I think we can compete with. It's the one after this that I don't want to face. Marin. Marin, it must hear us. It's looking this way. Look at it, Hafner. He's holding his hands up to show us he's got no weapon. Drop your rifle. Are you sure? Drop your rifle! He's, he's coming this way. He's got one of those white blossoms in his hand. Yes. Must be a sign of peace. Wait. It looks almost like a man. I wonder what's inside that body. I wonder what's inside that head. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Verbal Agreement by Arthur Sellings, the story of an unsuccessful poet who was forced to ask what it was the aliens could want that was half as precious as the skins they wouldn't sell. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Student Body, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by F.L. Wallace and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were John Raby, Bob Hastings, Kate Wilkinson, James Stevens, Charles Carruth, and Merrill E. Joels. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Bob Maurer and is an NBC Radio Network production. Suppose you met a man in a tavern and he told you quite seriously that he wasn't a man at all, that he was the last Martian left alive. Well, that's what happens to a newspaper reporter next week when he is sent out on what appears to be a routine crank story. What happens next, though, is very far from routine as the interview leads to a whole succession of astonishing events. The story is The Last Martian by Frederick Brown. Next week on X-1. The Fisher Body Awards to Teenagers will be made tonight on the NBC Radio Network. In just a moment, X-1, but first... 
Now, there's a melody you'll recognize, opus number one in the inimitable Dorsey style. Then there'll be lots more of your favorite tunes, old and new, on NBC Bandstand all this week. The Dorsey Brothers will appear in person, and you'll also enjoy some of the sweetest music this side of heaven by Guy Lombardo and the Royal Canadians. Wayne King and Freddie Martin come along, too, together with bright personalities like Burt Parks and Johnny Mercer. It's wonderful live music weekday mornings with NBC Bandstand. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one... Tonight, The Last Martian by Frederick Brown. It was like any evening, but duller than most. I was back in the city room. I'd just covered a boring banquet, and the food had been so bad that I felt cheated, even though it cost me nothing. Now, just for laughs, and my job... I was writing a long, glowing account of it. City desk, Cargan. Yeah? You what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, Bonnie. Yeah. Uh, Bill. Yeah? You finished typing that banquet story yet? Uh-uh. Finish it, huh? 30. Okay. You know Barney Welch, don't you? Barney's bar? Of course I know him. I know you know him. It's just a rhetorical question. What about him? He just phoned. So? He's got a guy down there. Who? Claims to be from Mars. What, is he drunk or raving or both? Barney doesn't know. But he said there might be a gag store if you want to come over and talk to the guy. Drinks on the expense account? Yeah. You got a deal. <laughs> There wasn't a trib reporter who didn't know Barney well enough to borrow money from him. I made for the bar like a St. Bernard makes for a fallen traveler and ordered a quick one with water on the side. Uh, keep the bottle handy, Barney. Which one is the Martian? Uh, you see the tall, uh, dismal-looking guy sitting alone there in the booth? Over there? That's him. What's his story? Well, he says he just got in from Mars two hours ago, and he's trying to figure it out. He claims he's the last living Martian. Mm-hmm. Does he know I'm a reporter? Uh, uh, but he'd talk to anybody who'll listen to him. What's his name? He says it's uh, Yangon Dow. I'll talk to him. Now, listen, Bill. Yeah? Uh, don't get him violent or anything. Huh? I, I don't want no trouble in my place. Oh, now, don't worry, Barney. Look, dish up two beers for us, and I'll take them over with me. Barney drew two beers and cut off their heads. He rang up 60 cents, gave me my change, and I went over to the Martian. Mr. Dow? Yes? You mind if I sit down? Help yourself. It's a free country. I brought you beer. Barney, the bartender, told me something about your problem. Oh? Thanks for the beer. Drink up. <sighs> well, I suppose you think I'm out of my mind, but... Well, maybe you'll be right. The bartender probably thinks I've flipped my lid. Listen, are you a doctor? Nope. Do you think I'm insane? I'm not a doctor, and I haven't even heard your story yet. How can I tell? Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you everything that happened 
Then you tell me if you think I'm all right. <sighs> Two hours ago, I was on Mars. Two hours? Uh, how did you get here? I don't know. That's the horrible thing. All I know is that the others were dead. All of them? How do you know? I saw them. I saw their bodies in the street. It was awful. Now, wait a minute. You mean you're the last one? The last Martian? Yes. Well, that's uh, a little hard to believe. Listen, I was there. I was in this room in the city of Scar. I don't know why I was there, but I was. I was locked in. Then I got hungry, and there was nobody to bring me food. So I worked a stone out of the floor and started digging. It took three days. When I got out and reached the street, everyone, everyone was dead, lying in the open. What did you do? I took a Targan, an energy plane, and flew it to Xandar. Xandar is the biggest city, the capital. Every place, it was the same. Hundreds of thousands of bodies lying in the fields, the streets, as if, as if everyone had died at the exact same instant at Xandar in the stadium. I'm listening. In the stadium, there were a, a hundred thousand of them, as if, as if they'd come there specially to die together. I landed my ship there. In the stadium? Yes, I see. Well, there, in the stadium, they had built some sort of platform. On it was a column made of copper. Copper is a rare metal on Mars. And there was a push button. Where? In the copper column. Oh. And there was a Martian in a blue robe, a priest, right under the button. It was as though he'd pushed the button and died. And everybody else had died with him. Except you? Yes. All except me. And then? And then? I was on a Madison Avenue bus, riding to work. Here in New York. Oh, now wait a minute. Listen, I know you don't believe me. I know it sounds as if I was stark raving now, mad, but take I... take it easy, huh? You know what I think. What? You've had some sort of terrible shock. Well, of course I have. There were three million of us, all dead. I don't mean that kind of shock. Of course, it, it was a dying world anyway. We didn't have more than two generations left. It was the krill. What was the krill? The disease. It reduced us to one-thirtieth of our population in two centuries. These uh, three million, and they, they died of the krill? No. The krill kills slowly. These people died like that, with a push of a button. Why didn't they escape? We tried to develop space travel, but we couldn't. We couldn't even reach Deimos or Phobos. Where are they? Our moons. Oh, I, I don't know too much about this stuff. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Down? Anything you like. Well, if the Martians didn't develop space travel, how do you think you got here in New York City? I don't know. It's driving me wild. I'm Yang and Dal, a Martian. And I'm here in the body of an Earthman. The body of an Earthman? Of course. You don't think Martians look exactly like humans, do you? I'm three feet tall, weigh what would be 20 pounds here on Earth. I have four arms and six fingers on each hand. <clears throat> uh, Barney. Yeah? Two more beers, huh, with whiskey chasers? Right. Uh, uh, go on, go on, Mr. Don. I don't mean to interrupt. It frightens me. Oh, I can understand that. Here's some drinks. We want some help. Uh-uh. Thanks, Barney. Uh, drink up, Mr. Don. Thank you. By the way, uh, who is this Earthman whose body you've got? Its name is Howard Wilcox. Howard Wilcox, hmm? I'll just write that down. Uh, address? Uh, it's in the wallet. 45 Amber Court. Mm -hmm. uh, this Howard Wilcox, whose body you're in, uh, does he have a family? It is married to a female of this species, yes. Well, have you been home? No. Then how do you know? 
I have all of its memories. I can do everything it could do. I know everything it knows. Oh, I see. I even have its tastes. Beer, for instance. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have a job? At the Humber Lamp Company, 34th Street. Well, maybe you ought to call your wife. No, I... It frightens me. Why? I... This body... It loves its wife. Uh, let me buy us a round. There's money in these pockets. Okay. It's very good of you to listen to my story. Uh, barkeep, another round, please. Uh, tell me, Mr. Dow, did you ever suspect before that you were a Martian? Suspect? I am a Martian. Don't you understand? Well, how did you get in here? I told you, I was... I mean, this body was on its way to work. On a Madison Avenue bus, and then... I was inside it. It was thirsty, so it stopped for a drink. And I thought, maybe the bartender could give me some advice. So I started talking. Don't you believe me? Listen, Howard, uh, you should be due home for dinner by now. Now, you're making your wife worry. Why not phone her? I'm afraid. What's there to worry about? Whether you're Young and Dahl or Howard Wilcox, there's a woman sitting home worrying. I suppose you're right. Of course I'm right. You're very understanding. Oh, not at all. I... You wouldn't want to come with me, would you? Hmm? I mean, I'm... I'm sort of afraid. Well, it would look funny. I, I, I could tell her you're an old school friend. We could have dinner... And then maybe I could get to know her. You really want me to come? Would you? Let me make a phone call first, okay? Fine. I rang up the Tribune and got Cargan at the city desk. Hi, Bill Everett. Did you find him? Uh-huh. Well? There's something strange about this guy. You think he's insane? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Is he or isn't he? Well, he's got the whole story so perfectly organized, he might even convince somebody it's true. He remembers every detail. What do you figure you're going to do? Well, I'm going home with him. I'm going to meet his wife and observe them. How many drinks have you had? Oh, I'm sober. Don't worry. Me worry? <laughs> Look, maybe you better come back here and I'll let Vincent handle this story. No, that isn't necessary. Just let me tag along a while. Okay. But if you want help, yell, and I'll send Vincent. I will, don't worry. What's this guy's name? Yang and, uh, I mean, Howard Wilcox. Address? 45 Amber Court. Okay. Oh, and Bill. Yes? Just remember one thing. What's that? You could be playing with dynamite. Watch your step. Number 45 Amber Court was an apartment down in the village. We were met at the door by a pretty woman in dungarees with her black hair and a ponytail with a red ribbon. Uh, let me handle it, okay? I wish you would. Howard, I was so worried. Uh, uh, th this is Bill Everett. I'm an old boyhood chum of your husband, Mrs. Wilcox. We oh. met and I asked Howard to have a few drinks and, uh, I'm afraid it's all my fault. Bill is having dinner with us. If it isn't too much trouble. Well, I... No, no, of course not. Well, that's very generous of you. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'd better start dinner. Uh, Howard? Yes? Are you all right? Why, yes. Fine. You didn't kiss me. Oh, I... well. <laughs> that's better. That's the first time in 11 years Howard hasn't kissed me when he came home. Well, we stopped and had a few drinks. It was all my fault, really. Look, just make yourself comfortable. I won't be long. Do you think she suspects? Of course not. I'll have to tell her. You want to wind up in an institution? No, but I can't keep up this pretense. Just set your mind to it. Now, after a while, it'll become natural. You'll forget that you ever were a Martian. You do believe me, then, about being a Martian? Of course. Oh, that's good to know. Now, look, whatever you do, don't tell your wife. It would ruin her life. I'll try not to tell her. Try very hard. Now, don't tell anybody. You and the bartender know, of course. Well, we'll keep it quiet. Don't worry. Good. Do you think you can carry it off? I... I'll try. Good boy. Now, I'll tell you what. If you get into any kind of trouble, I mean, if you just have to talk to somebody about it, give me a call, hmm? Uh, here, at this number. Now, if I'm not in, you leave a message with my boss. His name is Cargan. Cargan. You promise? I promise. Fine. 
You're very kind. This body, I, I mean, I, I've i never met anybody so kind here on Earth. Forget it. Well, what have you two been discussing so secretly? Just business. Oh, I, I'm sorry about being late, dear. Well, you might have phoned. After all, you were only a few blocks from the house. It isn't as if you were on Mars or someplace. <laughs> Dinner went pretty well, and Elaine Wilcox turned out to be an expert at shish kebab, which is one of my favorites. After dinner, I still had a couple of hours to put in at the paper, so I went back. Cargan came over to me right away. Well? Well? Is he or isn't he? He's a Martian, all right. No question about that. You're very funny. I have my moments. Would you mind telling me exactly where you've been for three hours and what you've been doing? I talked to Yangan Dao. That's his Martian name. Then we had dinner at his home. Very nice. Shish kebab. What about the story? Oh, yeah, the story. Well, it seems that he was locked in a room in the city of Scar. And he got out and saw all the dead bodies of the entire Martian population. Then he flew to the capital and saw a button that a priest had pressed. And the next thing he knew, he was inside an earthman named Howard Wilcox riding a Madison Avenue bus. Want me to write it up? Is that all you've got to tell me? That's all. Listen, this guy's going to be perfectly all right as soon as he gets used to the idea that he's Howard Wilcox. He is, sir. Uh... I suppose you're a qualified psychiatrist? Well, I'm qualified to judge this. I'd better send Vincent over there. There's no need for that. I have a distinct feeling you've let your emotions get into the act. Well, what's wrong with emotions? They don't belong in this business. Look, Cargan, this is a decent enough guy. He's a little bewildered, maybe. Now, why not let him live out his life in peace? He may be dangerous. Don't you trust my judgment? We can't afford to pass up anything important. Oh, you're exaggerating. Maybe. Vincent! Yes, Mr. Cargan? I want you to do a follow-up on a story that Bill has started. A man named Howard Wilcox who thinks he's a Martian. Oh? Bill has the address. Now, if anything happens to this guy, there are liable to be questions and accusations. Vincent can handle that out of it. You want the full treatment on this story, Mr. Cargan? If you think the man is a menace, give him the full treatment. Okay, Mr. Cargan. I gave Vincent the address, feeling like a murderer, and then I beat it to the nearest phone booth and called Howard Wilcox's home. His wife, Elaine, answered. Yes? Well, Mrs. Wilcox, this is Bill Everett again. Oh, did you forget something? No, uh, I have something to tell you, and it may sound a little weird, but bear with me. Oh, what is it? A man from my newspaper is coming over. His name is Vincent. He's a big, ugly man with a scar on his lip. He's coming over here? He's on his way now. Well, what for? Well, that's the part you aren't going to believe, Mrs. Wilcox. Well, try me and see. He's going to murder your husband. I'm afraid I didn't hear you. I said he's coming over to murder your husband. You and Howard did do quite a bit of drinking. I'm trying to do you a favor. Now, listen to me. I'm listening. Send him away. Tell him Howard had to leave town. Do you hear me? Please, Mrs. Wilcox, if your husband means anything to you. Well, of course he does, but why not call the police? They'll laugh at you. I'm coming right over. I'll explain when I get there. And remember, your husband's life depends on this. I didn't know whether I'd convinced her or not. It all sounded so terribly melodramatic. Anyway, I hopped into a cab and told him to use a heavy foot on the gas pedal. And about 15 minutes later, I arrived at 45 Amber Court. It's you. Was Vincent here? There was a man here from the Tribune, yes. Did you do as I told you? Well, I... I got Howard out of the house. I sent him out for some mozzarella cheese and gave him a couple of places that don't carry it. What'd Vincent say? I told him Howard wouldn't be back in town till tomorrow. He said he'd be back. Did he say what he wanted? Just that he had some good news for my husband. Some good news? Uh, may I come in? I wish you would. I want to know what this is all about. Sit down. Mm -hmm. Now, would you mind explaining? You won't believe me. You keep saying that. Okay, Mrs. Wilcox. Your husband, Howard, is a Martian. A, a Martian? That's right. I see. And when did you discover this about my husband? This morning. 
Uh, would you mind telling me just when he arrived? Uh, from Mars, that is. This morning. You don't say. Told you you wouldn't believe me. Oh, I hadn't said that yet. You're sure Howard is a Martian? Yep. He claims to be the last Martian. Look, see if I can make it clear. There was a plague sweeping Mars. Now, they devised a means of transporting their intellects through space to Earth. Their dead bodies remained behind. Now, Howard, uh, your husband, was confined in an institution so he didn't get to go with the other Martian souls. He dug his way out and went to the capital city where the energy machine was located. Mm -hmm. I guess there was enough left to send his intelligence down here where it landed in the body of one Howard Wilcox. Uh, how did you find this out? He told me. <sighs> Mr. Everett, if you don't mind, I'm rather tired. First you tell me someone's going to murder Howard, then you tell me he's the man from Mars. Now, I'd like to get some rest, if you don't mind. I'm trying to convince you your husband is in danger. If Howard is a Martian, just why did your Mr. Vincent want to kill him? Because Mr. Vincent is a Martian, too. Uh -huh. I suppose the editor of the Tribune is also a Martian? No, not the editor, just the editor of the City Desk. And you, Mr. Everett, are you a Martian, too? Matter of fact, yes. Good night. Just won't see it, will you? Good night, Mr. Everett. Okay, I tried my best. Martians, indeed. Oh, Howard, thank heavens. Oh, I couldn't get the mozzarella. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Tell me, Howard, are you a Martian? What? Why, yes. How did you know? Oh, woman's intuition. It's terribly late, dear. Let's turn in. No, not yet. I want to know how you knew I was a Martian. Howard, please, I've had just about enough of this nonsense today. It isn't nonsense to me. Only this morning I was Yang Gandal, a Martian. Now I'm in the body of your husband. Is this a joke you and your friend Mr. Everett invented to torture me? Because if it is... It I... isn't a joke. It's the truth. Howard, I just can't stand much more of this. I I'm beginning to wonder if, it if it's me. Who could that be at this hour? I'll answer it. Yes? You are Mr. Howard Wilcox? Yes. My name is Vincent. I'm a reporter from the Trib. Yes? May I come in? Yes. Who is... Oh, Mr. Vincent. I see your husband has unexpectedly returned from out of town, Mrs. Wilcox. Now, look here. Would you mind telling me why you lied to me? Yes, I would. Does it have anything to do with the fact that you know your husband's secret? What secret? That he is young and dull, a Martian. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. Why is there such concern? I am Yang and Dal. I am a Martian. The last Martian, as far as I know. That is where you're wrong, Mr. Wilcox. Wrong? You see, there are many of us. Many? Like me? Hundreds of thousands. We were teleported to Earth during the Great Migration and found ourselves, like you, inside human beings. But then I'm not alone. You do understand my position. Perfectly. I can establish contact... We can remember our old home. Unfortunately, no. I, I don't understand. Sadly enough, young and dull, you were considered mentally ill on Mars. Ill enough so that you were institutionalized. But uh, Here on Earth, a person like you represents a distinct threat to us. How do I threaten you? You're unstable. You may give us away. That would spoil it. Spoil what? Our plan. Plan? You, uh... You have not heard of the plan? I heard of no plan. I was in an institution. Yes. You are certain now? Of course. What plan? If you knew, I would have been forced to destroy you... You've just saved your own life, young and dull, and that of Howard Wilcox as well. What are you going to do? Nothing. Nothing at all. Aren't you afraid that I'll do something? Such as? Tell people my husband is a Martian. Really, Mrs. Wilcox, you know better. 
You'd be laughed at or sent to the nearest psychiatric clinic. No, we aren't at all concerned with the fact that people will betray our presence here on Earth. I'm sure you can appreciate the reaction if you were to phone the police and tell them that the Trib reporters are all Martians. Well, not all. Just the city editor and yourself and Mr. Everett. How did you know that? Perhaps I'm one myself, Mr. Vincent. That isn't possible. Why not? Are you... Tell me where you were born. What city? I was born in Undanel, near the dead canal of Krilla. Your name? Zanat Kree. You are... You are party to the plan? The plan to take over the Earth? Of course. Your husband, Young and Dahl. Why did you not inform him? For the same reason you did not. He is unstable. But there is no need to worry. I will care for him. Amazing. Now, would you mind leaving us alone? We have many things to discuss. Of course. Amazing. Positively amazing. I was standing in Barney's bar having a double scotch in the rocks when Vincent came in looking like a man who spent the last three hours in a KitchenAid mixer with a dial on Fluffy. He came over and ordered without so much as a look at me. Uh, here it is, Mr. Vincent. Thanks. You okay? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, by the way, uh, did you fellas take care of that crackpot who was in here this afternoon, the one who thought he was a Martian? Hmm? Uh, uh sure, sure. Just a drunk, huh? Yeah, that's right. Wouldn't you say so, Bill? Oh, definitely. Well, here's to you, Barney. Sometimes you can't tell the Martians from the Earthmen. <laughs> you know? It's getting to be that way, Mr. Vincent. Right, Bill? That's right, Barney. Integration. That's what it is. gave Barney a sly wink and lifted my glass along with Vincent's. Of course, Barney understood. You see, he's one of us, too. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Alan Cogan's story, Nothing But the Best, which tells about a strange mix-up in time and place. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Last Martian, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Frederick Brown and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Mandel Kramer, Elliot Reed, Santos Ortega, Ralph Bell, John McGovern, and Patricia Wheel. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Go to the conventions with NBC Radio beginning Monday, August 13th. In just a moment, X minus one, but first. You are listening to the distinctive style of Claude Thornhill, one of today's top musicians and band leaders. It's popular music with all the beauty of a classical symphony. And there are more fine arrangements by Claude Thornhill all this week when he makes his appearance on NBC Bandstand. In addition, you're treated to the inimitable beat and rhythm of master jazz man Lionel Hampton. Join MC's Burt Parks and Dick Hames all this week on NBC Bandstand. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Snowball Effect, by Catherine McLean. I took over the university at a time of crisis. For one thing, we had been placed on probation by the conference for overpaying football players by 100%, and one half of the varsity was penalized a year's eligibility. On top of that... I was called in by Mr. Harvey J. Grover of the Board of Trustees. We had lunch at 21 on his expense account, and after the Napoleon brandy, he lowered the boom. Dr. Holloway, the university is in crisis. I know, Mr. Grover, I know, but I'm assured that our scouts have turned up several likely zinc miners in Colorado. You can assure the board that we'll have a line to reckon with next season. I'm not talking about football. There are other things at the university, I'm told. Well, of course, of course. Holloway, as president of the university, you've taken on a grave responsibility. Oh, I know, I know. I don't mind telling you the board has been gravely concerned. The number one problem facing us is academic freedom. It is? You're darn tooting. We want every academic department free from debt, running in the black. Is that clear? Academic freedom, huh? I see. Any faculty that can't support itself by grants, bequests... Corporation or government contracts is out. All of them? Down to the last assistant instructor. Look, Holloway, I'll, I'll put this to you straight. Most of the board was against hiring you. They had a bright young plant manager from General Products they said could show a profit from a candy store in the Mojave Desert. But I stood up for you. Why, thank you, sir. I told them the president of university has got to be at least a high school graduate or it doesn't look good. You know... You did graduate from high school, didn't you? Oh, yes, yes. And, and college, too. I got my master's at Harvard and my doctorate at... Oh, uh, never mind. Let's, uh, let's not go too far. Have you got this straight now? Oh, yes, yes. I've got to make a profit on the candy store. I mean, the university. That's right. Oh, and uh, Holloway. Yes? How many zinc miners did you say uh, we dug up? I started in with anthropology, astronomy, astrophysics, agriculture... Almost all the departments could show a nice, healthy contract from the Department of Defense for research, or from some corporation. Even the classical wing came out okay. They were being subsidized by a pride of Texas millionaires who thought it was cute to have original Greek and Latin tombstones set in concrete on their patios. One fellow from Galveston gave a classical barbecue featuring a swimming pool with pornographic marbles from Pompeii set around the scum gutter. I ran into my first problem when I got to sociology. Now, look, Dr. Caswell, I'll be frank with you. I'm paid to make sure this institution doesn't come out on the short end of the stick. Well, that's a, a quaint expression. I got it from Mr. Grover of the Board of Trustees, so you can see this is no time for kidding ourselves. Can sociology pull its own weight? What is it? Sociology is the study of social institutions. Now, look, Caswell, to the Board of Trustees, sociology sounds like socialism, and nothing can sound worse than that. Come on now, what are you doing that's worth anything? My dear sir... And don't wrinkle your nostrils at me, Caswell. If you've allergies, take an antihistamine. If not, just answer my question. This department's analysis of institutional accretion by the use of open system mathematics has been recognized as an outstanding and valuable contribution to... Valuable in what way? Well, since the Depression, Washington has been using sociological studies of employment... Uh, labor and standards of living as a basis for its general policies Please, of... please, Professor, stick to brass tacks and leave Washington out of this. What specifically has the work of this specific department done that would make it as worthy to receive money as, say, a heart research fund? Fundamental research doesn't show immediate effects, Dr. Holloway, but the value is recognized. As well, all the other departments have managed to squeak by. You're the last one. Unless you can tow the mark, there'll be 14 sociologists testing the institutional efficiency of unemployment insurance as an instrument of economic policy. Caswell knew I had him. Unless he could show me how his department could scratch a buck together, I'd have to expunge his name from the catalog and have him drummed out of the faculty club. I'll hand it to him, though. 
He glared from behind his pince nez, and uh, sliding into his lecture manner, he started his con. Institutions, organizations, that is, have certain tendencies built into the way they happen to have been organized, which cause them to expand or contract without reference to the needs they were founded to serve. I have developed a form of uh, socio-mathematics to plot these factors, and by comparing formulae... Is it all perfectly clear to you? <laughs> well, it wasn't to me either. I grasped the idea that he could tell whether an organization would get bigger or smaller and why. And so I asked him for proof. Well, I, uh, I could give you a demonstration. How quickly? Uh, six months. All right, let's see. We've got a basketball team averaging seven feet. That ought to keep the board busy till spring. And after that, that bonus picture we stole from the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, all right, Caswell, you've got six months. I forgot about Caswell and sociology department for a couple of days while I went back to convincing semi-literate millionaires that they might as well leave a couple of millions to the university rather than have the federal snap it up in inheritance taxes. I was on to a real beaut, a button manufacturer with a bad heart who could go any minute, who wanted to endow a scholarship for needy and intellectually gifted lacrosse players. When Caswell came back to see me, we had lunch at the student cafeteria on my expense account. And he explained. Ever hear of feedback effects? Is it something to do with reducing overweight co-eds? Uh, no, no, it's a mathematical term. You might call it the snowball effect. You mean like rolling a snowball downhill? That's right. It grows. Now, here's the mathematical symbol. That spiral? Uh, that's the formula for the general growth process. Uh, do you understand the equation? Why, right. no. It accounts for all sorts of institutional growth, the Roman Empire, Alexander, the Masons, the uh, spread of tobacco, anything. You see, when the snowball becomes too heavy for the cohesion strength of snow, it, it breaks apart. Now, we've decided to run the test on an organization and make it grow according to the formula. I see. You're going to use some club or lodge or something as a guinea pig. If you could follow the equation, you'd see I've built a pattern of a, a cogent reason for the ins to drag in new members from the outs and an urgent factor to prevent anyone from resigning. That's this uh, Greek symbol here. Kappa for compulsion. I suggested a few changes in the organization plan, and we finally worked out a setup that was nice and simple. We put our heads closer together and tried to pick the best place for a demonstration. It should be small enough to observe, and yet large enough to be statistically significant. How about Passaic, New Jersey? My sister lives there. Oh, let's make it Watershaw. I have some student sociological surveys of it already. We can pick a suitable group from that. We've got to make this an ironclad demonstration. We'll have to pick some little two-foot nothing club that nobody would ever expect to grow. Some miserable, pathetic little organization. <laughs> We found the perfect test guinea pig, the Watershaw Wednesday night sewing circle. Caswell and I drove over next Thursday night to a meeting. They always met Thursday night, except every once in a while when the chair lady forgot to have her hair set, in which case they met Friday. Well, uh, girls, girls, girls! Uh, ladies, girls, we had business to conduct, girls. Helen, please. Oh, well... The regular meeting is now called to order. Bernice. Just a minute, dear. Will the secretary... Uh, Bernice. You're out of order, dear. Uh, it's not a regular meeting. But of course it is. It's Thursday, isn't it? I distinctly remember when we had that special meeting on Tuesday for Toby's baby shower. We adjourned sign or die when she started to have pain. Well, my goodness, it was forced labor. That certainly doesn't count. But this meeting is just a continuation of the other one. Oh. How do you feel, Toby? Fine. A little out of breath. Did you try a little dry toast just before climbing the stairs? But, Bernice... My doctor said to breathe deeply through my nose and to have Henry tie my shoes for me. Well, I'd like to see Alfred tie anything for me. It's three years since I dared get a dress that zipped up the back. Madam Chairman, I rise to a point of order. Well, my goodness, Helen, you don't have to be a martyr about it. <laughs> That's the way the meeting of the Watershaw Sewing Circle went on. After a prolonged parliamentary battle, the point was finally carried that this was the tail end of a previously adjourned special meeting. At this point, the secretary, who had a shorthand training, read the minutes. 
It was moved by Harriet that a vote of confidence be registered in the administration of the club's business by Bernice. The motion was seconded by Elsie, who said she thought it was only fair because Bernice didn't even have an unlimited phone. And look at all the calls she had to make on club business. The motion was amended by Joan to include Bernice Calloway as well as Bernice Hackett because with two Bernices, the whole thing would be confusing and it didn't seem fair to discriminate between Bernices because Bernice Calloway didn't have an unlimited phone either. And besides, her phone was way upstairs in the bedroom without even a kitchen extension. The motion was defeated because of the lack of a quorum. <laughs> Finally, the new business of the meeting was reached, and Bernice, um, what's her name, introduced Professor Caswell and myself as observing professors doing a survey of charitable institutions. After the business meeting, brownies, sponge cake, and apricot uh, peekaboo cookies were served with coffee. And Caswell and I drew the unlimited Bernice aside. You see, Mrs. Hackett, I've been making a few notes on a slightly modified constitution and bylaws for your organization. You have? You see, it all depends on having a competent and capable lady in charge. Oh, yes. Yes, frankly, I see. Frankly, this plan would be dangerous unless there was a woman of great character elected to the post of chair lady. Well, of course. You see, there are several ways of, well, influencing an election. Oh. That's why it's important that only the right people fully understand this. Oh, you're right. Absolutely. Why, the organization was just floundering before the last election. Now, uh, can I see those plans, Professor? They sound like they're just what we need. Naturally, she was hooked. As Caswell buttered her up, her eyes began to gleam, and she studied the simple little bylaws and constitution the professor had drawn up nodding happily as the classic beauty of the scheme struck home. The meeting broke up when after four brownies and a wedge of butterscotch cashew angel food surprise, Toby started to have real labor pains. We found out later it was a nine and a half pound boy. Caswell and I left the meeting and stopped for a pizza and beer to get the taste of the apricot peekaboo cookies out of our mouths. Well, there you are, Dr. Holloway. They adopted our bylaws with only one dissenting vote. I don't like that secretary. She's a spoiler. Always suspicious. My first wife was like that. Don't worry. She hasn't got a chance. That Bernice woman has clear sailing under my equations. It's rigged to favor an aggressive extrovert over the paranoidal personality. You're sure it'll work now? I'd stake my academic reputation on it. You have. Don't worry, Dr. Holloway. We've given that sewing circle more growth drives than the Roman Empire. We let the whole thing gel for a while. About four months later, I shook loose from my schedule and dropped over to see Caswell. He looked up from a student paper on the correlation of Bermuda shorts seen at Madison Avenue and 46th Street to the swing towards Democratic candidates in the Corn Belt. Ah, uh, good morning, Dr. Holloway. Uh, good morning. Caswell, I just wanted you to know we hadn't forgotten you. Now, about that sewing club business, I'm beginning to feel the suspense. Could I get an advance uh, report on how it's coming? Well, I haven't been following it that closely. We're supposed to let it run the full six months and then check. Uh, but I'm curious. Could I get in touch with that woman? Uh, what's her name? Bernice something? Uh, Hackett. Uh, Bernice Hackett. Would it change the results if we checked it now? Not in the slightest. If you want to graph the membership rise, it should be going up in a long curve, probably doubling ever so often. Well, if it's not rising, you're fired, you know. If it's not rising, you won't have to fire me. I'll burn my books and shoot myself. <laughs> I went back to my office and put in a call to Watershaw. Mrs. Hackett wasn't in. The maid informed me she was at the meeting. That sounded better. If the sewing circle was meeting on a Saturday, then maybe Caswell had a chance. But she wasn't going to a sewing circle meeting. There was another organization, the Civic Welfare League. I hung up the phone and thought about poor Caswell. If the sewing circle had really gone up the flue, he was on his way up with it. I decided to go over to Watershaw and check to give the poor old goat the benefit of the doubt. The meeting of the Welfare League was in the Knights of Columbus building, a tremendous pile used for dozens of club meetings at a time. There was some kind of political rally going on in the main hall. Streets were jammed, and I figured I was going to have a tough time finding the little back room where the Civic Welfare League was meeting. 
I figured they must be in a pretty bad way trying to hold a meeting in competition with a brawl like the one in the main room. Uh, right this way, uh, look, sir. Miss, I'm looking for a small meeting. Well, it's here you the, are. Uh, membership application, song sheet, bylaws, and pledge. No, no, you don't understand. I, I don't well, want Well, that's to... all right. You can keep it. It's a new membership kit. Everyone's supposed to have it. We've just printed up 6,000 copies to make sure there'll be enough for this meeting. No, you, you don't understand, miss. I'm looking for the meeting of the Civic Welfare League. Well, this is it. No, no, no. I mean the one with Mrs. Hackett. Bernice Hackett. <gasps> Do you know her? Well, there she is up on the speaker's platform. And now, after the ushers have passed among you with membership blanks, it is time to rededicate ourselves to the principles we stand for. With a bright and glowing future, the best people in the best planned town in the country, the jewel of the United States. All we need is more members. Now get out there and recruit! 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 Yeah! I cornered Bernice Hackett at the speaker's table. She had a clear, sparkling look to her eye, and she was dressed in a trim gray suit with a towering feather on a small hat. A clutch of pretty junior ushers, all with goose pimples showing above strapless formals, clustered about her. I managed to get to see her in the back room while the mayor was addressing the meeting. There. It's a pleasure to see you. What happened to the sewing circle? Oh, it's just a little change, that's all. Helen, dear. Yes, B.H. Send those wires out to the senator in Washington. You can tell him we want his support on the slum clearance or else. Check. And now let's see, where were we? Oh, yes. We started growing by amalgamating with other small charity groups. Worked much more efficiently that way. Bernice, we're running out of membership blank. Call the printer. He's got instructions to keep the type standing. Check. Naturally, we had to change our name each time. But we've still got the same constitution and bylaws, uh, the ones you professors worked out for us. Then you've been growing. Oh, dear, yes. Uh, Bernice. What do we do about the town board of aldermen? I explained to them they can't get in at a group rate. Each one will have to join separately. Check. Oh, yes, Professor. We're growing and growing and growing. I kept close watch on the sewing of the Civic Welfare League for the rest of the month. Evidently, they'd swallowed up the real estate organization because they came out with a plan to attract new industries to town, and there was a gimmick splitting up the profits among club members only. It was the same provision Caswell built in to split up profits from dues and fines, but now it was operating in the hundred thousand. I graphed the rise in membership, and it went up like the first rise in a roller coaster. I went over to Caswell's office to tell him the good news. Naturally, I knew the equations would work. Well, don't be so calm about it. With a demonstration like this, I can get all kinds of grants and funds for the sociology department. You'll think it's snowing money. Well, naturally, I expected this. I haven't been following the test at all, but I was quite confident. I don't mind admitting I wasn't. Well, that organization sure blew up. Now, let's see the formula for stopping it. Oh, I didn't complicate the organization with negatives. I, I wanted it to grow. It falls apart naturally when it stops growing for more than two months. You remember we built into it the idea that the members know what happens if the membership stops growing. Why, if I tried to stop it now, they'd cut my throat. Yeah, yeah, they sure were enthusiastic at that meeting. No, we'll just let it play out to the end of its tether and die of old age. And when will that be? Well, it can't grow past the female population of the town. There are only so many women in Watershaw, and some of them don't like sewing. Sewing? Sewing? Caswell! What's the matter? Uh, are you sick? You haven't been following the experiment? Why, no. I, I told you I haven't even thought about it since we started. Well, they wanted to expand, and they weren't going to let sewing stand in their way. They went from general charity to social welfare schemes to something that's pretty close to an incorporated government. They're now filing an application to change their name to the Civic Property Pool and Social Dividend Membership Combine. Well, well, very interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Fascinating. Dr. Caswell, tell me... Where? Where does the formula say it will stop? Oh, I shouldn't worry. It stops when you run out of people to join it. After all, there are only so many people in Watershaw. It's a pretty small town. Yes, yes it is. Doctor, they've opened a branch office in New York. Caswell got out his slide rule then, and we went over the charts I had been keeping. He ran the results through the physics department's new analog computer to check the results. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, yes, it, it checks. Well? 
Well, now, allowing a certain lag of contagion from one nation to another, uh, language and cultural barriers, you know, it'll reach total world population in 12 years. About one week after that, uh, various isolated pockets, uh, Australian bushmen, Tibetans, African pygmies, will all be members. You mean only 12 years? Mm, give or take a week, 12 years. The whole world? Well, there is something to be said for a worldwide government. Uh, many people are definitely in favor of it. But under Bernice Hackett, the whole world? Oh, you asked me for a demonstration. The equation works. But what happens when the whole world is organized and there are no new members? Well, two months after the organization stops growing, it collapses. It's built in the formula. Yes, but what happens then? Oh. Well, I haven't the faintest idea. I haven't carried the equations that far. Look, Caswell, whatever happens, I don't want anyone to ever pin this on me. From now on, if anyone asks me, I never heard of Watershaw. Well, that was 12 years ago. I think Caswell and I are about the only men on Earth who don't hold membership cards in the United Terrestrial Civic Welfare and International Property Pool. Bernice Hackett, Global Administrator. It's a race against time now. There hasn't been a new member in a week and a half, and Bernice is anxiously awaiting news from the first Mars expeditionary fleet. And as she says, if only they find life there, we need new members desperately. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Stars My Destination the first installment of a four-part serial by Alfred Bester, a brilliant novel on teleportation in the world of the future. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Snowball Effect, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Catherine McLean and adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Ted Osborne, Wendell Holmes, Warren Parker, Audrey Blum, Mary Patton, Patsy O'Shea, and Peggy Allenby, your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Thousands of hearts are being saved today, and many persons with heart disease are learning how to live happier and more useful lives. The fact is, most heart patients can keep on working often at the same job. This progress is the result of intensive medical research, research which you support when you give to the Heart Fund. Send a contribution now to your local heart association or to heart care of your post office. When you help your heart fund, you help your heart. Only NBC Radio brings you the whole convention story. Listen tonight. <laughs> Just a moment, X minus one. But first... Once again, NBC Bandstand brings you some of the nation's top name bands in person. This week, Ralph Flanagan fills your weekday mornings with his wonderful hit tune. Slow numbers are fast. There's no mistaking the delightful Flanagan style. And then, Art Mooney and his orchestra are also on hand with plenty of lively and rhythmic arrangements. The four lads take the Mr. Music spot this week, and Bert Parks is back as permanent MC. Hear them all on NBC Bandstand. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one.
Tonight, Surface Tension by James Blish. Come in, Professor. Come in. Mr. President, do sit down. I'm terribly sorry to have kept you waiting. Time has very little significance, sir. Well, now, uh, what is the urgent nature of your visit? Mr. President, for some time now at the Nuclear Institute, a group of us have been making a study of a new star which has entered our constellation. Yes, the military advised me there was some disturbance. We've completed our calculation, sir. And? Before I give you our results... Let me tell you that we've been in touch with the Scientific Council of the Asian Confederation. They've verified the results. I'm waiting, Professor. Mr. President, the effect of this new star in our galaxy will be extremely catastrophic. At the rate it's expanding, it will cause the sun to explode. The what? The sun is going to explode. But well, that means... Exactly. The world will end in precisely two weeks and seven hours. This is incredible. Are you absolutely certain of these calculations? Absolutely. Does anyone know of this? Well, as soon as we guessed where our study was leading us, we classified all information. The actual final results are known only to a small group of scientists here and in the Asian Confederation. Two weeks. And seven hours. That would be September 4th, 2056. At approximately 12 noon. Is there anything to be done? Nothing. The other planets, Mars, Venus... All will be destroyed. The universe as we know it will disintegrate. And the race will vanish. It's, it's, it's impossible. Those are the facts, Mr. President. How you choose to make them public, if you do choose to make them public, is a matter of government. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, has the president of the Asian Confederation been notified? He's being notified at this moment. Hmm... I intend to take the following steps, Professor. First, I will contact the Asian Confederation. Uh, what's the name of their chief scientist? Uh... Dr. Gorlick. Ah, yes. I'll propose that you and Dr. Gorlick be given every resource to find a method of preserving the race. You'll be flown to their laboratories by rocket ship in an hour. I would like to spend these remaining days with my family. Your family could accompany you. They'll ask questions. They should know better by now. You will not release the information to the public. I would prefer to keep it a complete secret, provided the Asians agree, of course. A public announcement would only create utter panic and chaos. I assume it will happen instantaneously? Yes, instantaneously. Mm. Then secrecy is best. Oh, one thing, Mr. President. Yes? I wonder if perhaps religious leaders should be told. Professor, I believe in the power of God myself. I also believe that my single prayer can be heard by the Almighty just as well as if there were ten million. There will at least be two of us, Mr. President. I, too, will pray. Dr. Gorlick? Professor, how nice to meet you again. Do sit down, sit down. Thank you. Quite a problem, eh? It's quite a problem. If the rest of the world knew what we too know. I feel they should be informed, nevertheless. Well, that part of it is for the administrators. We have our own world. Do you seriously believe that we have the remotest chance of solving this problem in the two weeks that remain for the universe to exist? That depends on what you consider a solution, Professor. Anything that will preserve the race. In that case, we have a solution. You're joking. About so serious a matter? Hardly. But would you step over to the table, please? Now, if you will be so good, uh, look into that eyepiece in front of you while I focus it. Will you tell me, please, what you see there? Fascinating. Most unusual. Would you be good enough to describe it? Yes, of course. I I see what looks like a section of a large swimming pool. Plant life. Very tiny and uh, some kind of animal life, almost 
molecular in size. Good. Now let me change the magnification. Impossible. Go on, please. Describe. What? I see what looks like dogs, cats, a cow. Oh, evidently swimming underwater in this medium. W wait. Yes, they, they seem to be dogs and cows and cats, except that they appear to have a uh, gill-like breathing apparatus. Good, good. It looks as if somehow these species have been mutated to live underwater. Exactly, exactly. Well, I, uh, I don't understand how this is possible. It would take hundreds of generations, thousands of years possibly, to affect such a change. Even with modern genetic control. Ah, is the key, Professor. Let me ask you another question. Yes? Would you estimate the size of these creatures? I would say they're normal size. And the size of the pool, as you call it? Uh, a tank of quite enormous size. I, I cannot see the walls, but I assume they are there. Good. Now, Professor, prepare yourself for a shock. I've been a scientist too long to shock easily, Dr. Gorley. Nonetheless, you will be shocked to learn that what you have just been looking into is a single microscopic drop of water, less than a milligram. A single drop of water? Yes. The... Those dogs and cats are microscopic? Submicroscopic, smaller than a filterable virus. This is incredible, Doctor. Incredible, perhaps, but we have done it. Ah. Oh. We found a way to reduce the size of the original fertilized eggs through bombardment of the molecule. In this way, we can produce a full-size dog that is infinitesimal. And you believe this will help us solve our problem? I am convinced of it. What do you propose? This is our plan. We will create submicroscopic humans. At the submicroscopic level, a thousand generations can reproduce in the equivalent of a few seconds of time. In less than an hour, we can have a species of human that is capable of living underwater. Gill breathers? Precisely. And then what? Don't you see, my friend? In a single drop of water, we can reproduce as many human beings as now live in the city of uh, uh, New Chicago or Trans-Europa. But when the sun explodes in two weeks' time, all life, even that in a single drop of water, must perish. That is true, Professor. But remember this. To a submicroscopic species of human, two weeks would be the equivalent of some 20 million years on Earth. In other words, to these human beings, starting tomorrow, these species will have hundreds of thousands of generations, each living a full life, before the final explosion of the universe. Almost like playing God. I am not a subscriber to the concept of God, Professor. I must say I'm slightly shocked to discover that you, a man of science... Believes in a creator? I do, Doctor. In any event, will you help us go ahead with our experiment? I have no choice. Good. We'll begin tonight to produce the first species. <laughs> Careful with the virus. Here's the tube. Now then, we'll place this in a drop of water underneath the lens of the microscope. What about the evaporation and condensation of the drop? All outside factors will be controlled. Temperature, humidity, and so on. Will you turn on the lens, please? Now, using the highest magnification, we'll be able actually to manipulate a single being with electron magnets. A sensation we would interpret, possibly, as we interpret a centrifugal force. Ready? Ready. Good. We begin the experiment. Time? 1900 hours, 56 minutes, 3 seconds. Coming up on point four, three, two, one, zero. Observation. The first fertilized ovum, reduced to submicroscopic size, has begun to develop. 
Time? 19.56. 20 seconds. Coming up on two. One. Zero. Four submicroscopic human beings have been reproduced. Two appear to be males, two females. Time? 1956, 24. Observation. Ten generations of submicroscopic humans have been reproduced. Web toes and fingers and elementary gill modifications have begun in response to submersion of species in highly oxygenated vapor. Time? 1956, 45. 100 generations have reproduced. Increased water in vapor has resulted in gill structure, species now ready for total submersion in a droplet of water. Turn on the electron magnet. Now for the crucial part of the experiment. Total submersion. Then I should die, I feel like a murderer. The prolongation of the human race is at stake. It's a calculated risk. Still. Steady. I am about to affect the transfer. Steady. Now. Done. Look in the microscope, quickly. I can't find them. Let me. Ah, they're alive and swimming around. How many? Thousands. We've done it, Professor. Inside that drop of water, human beings like you and me, except for their gills, are already beginning to establish a civilization that will last for them millions of years. And for us. Two weeks to observe and wonder, and then... Unless a miracle should occur. Let us begin now. Time, please. 1900 hours, 56 minutes, 49 seconds, 3, 2, 1, 0. Observation. The equivalent of a million years has already passed inside our droplet of water. Human life is firmly established. Sir! Sir! Come in, Lavin! Come in! Oh, I swam down from the museum. I'm exhausted. Rest yourself. Would you like some proto steak? No, thank you. Breath of oxygen, perhaps? 100 proof distilled from pure upper level water. A breath, perhaps. Ah. Now, then, I assume that you've come about the place. Yes. Naturally, the directors of the museum are most anxious. I haven't completed the translation yet. It's been six months. Yes, I know that, but they're incomplete. One of them was evidently lost during the final battle with the eaters. Sure. Can you tell me off the record what you've already deciphered? Well, first, let me warn you. These plates were prepared thousands of generations ago. They're highly romantic. What they tell us may be fantasy. Oh, still, I'm fascinated. After all, the greatest archaeological discovery of all time buried a million years in the ooze at the bottom. Very well. The first line of the oldest plate reads as follows. It goes, In the beginning, we were created... Created? What an extraordinary concept. By whom? What about evolution? Yeah, let, let, let me finish. It goes... We were created by men who are not as we are, but who are our ancestors all the same. They were caught in some disaster, and they made us and put us here in our universe so that the race of men might live on. Ridiculous. Perhaps. Well, this supposes a universe other than ours. The theory has been advanced before. By fools. Fools. Look at us, Lavin. Are we really suited to this universe? Our gills, our webbed feet, these are the product of evolution and adaptation. But the shape of our bodies, the way we swim... Well, I'll admit there's some basis for the theory, but... Every experiment, every attempt to prove that anything exists outside, that the surface can be pierced. According to the plates, the surface can be pierced. Listen to this passage. There are three surfaces of the universe. The first is the bottom, where the water ends. The second is the thermocline, the dividing water between the bottom and the sky. The third is the surface film beyond which none can pass. And beyond the surface film, <laughs> beyond the surface is the universe of the creator. Well, the whole thing sounds like a parable or a song. Whatever it is, remember this. Thousands of generations pondered the miracle of our existence before these plates were written. Primitive. Men. You sound like a mystic, Char. To think that a scientist like yourself could believe in the existence of creators. Nonetheless, creators who were formed in our own image. Or we in theirs. I'm shocked. Truly. I intend to complete the translation of the plates. 
I will pursue this project for the rest of my life, if necessary. Time, Professor. Second day, 14 hours, 6 minutes, 10 seconds. Observation. The plates which were inscribed with microscopic data by an earlier generation have evidently been removed by a subsequent generation. Our study shows that a highly developed civilization is now living in the drop of water. Certain water organisms have been domesticated and underwater ships have been developed. The meeting of the council is called to order. Gentlemen, you all know the topic. Our speaker will be Shar. Gentlemen, some 28 time units ago, when I was a much younger man, I was given the privilege of translating some metal plates found buried in the bottom. As all of you know, I've devoted much of my life to convincing the world that travel through the surface film was not only possible but necessary to survive. Finally, the council has seen fit to grant my request for a special ship to accomplish this travel. I'm deeply grateful, and I would like to request my friend Lavin as head engineer for this project. Permission is granted. We wish you luck. The whole of our world will be following your expedition. What's happening, Dr. Gorlick? From what I can detect, the guild breeders are preparing for the equivalent of space travel. A large cylindrical ship is being built. What method of power are they using? I can barely detect it through the microscope, but my guess would be that they will use some form of living creatures to power the vessel. Shard a leader. Shard a leader. Leader, go ahead, Shard. The ship is ready to take off for the upper levels, leader. Water sealed in? All tight. Ty Tom's ready to move? Ty Tom's ready. We'll give you an escort of paramecium ships as far as the upper level. After that, you'll be on your own. Very good. Whenever you give the signal, Captain Lavin can order the Dye Toms to proceed. The sandbar is clear for the initial climb. Your course is straight up the stem of Water Plant 6. Dye Tom's ready? Dye Tom's ready, sir. Cilia in motion? Cilia in motion. Internal water circulators on? Circulators on. Countdown for takeoff. Five. Five. Four. Four. Three. Three. Two. Two. One. One. Zero. Dye Tom's in motion. Full speed ahead. Good luck. Well, sir... This is the beginning of your dream. If the ship holds. We've utilized every engineering principle known to man. Double construction of the toughest water lily, 2,000 living diatoms for power, 20 million sodium. I'm not worried about the power. I'm worried about the temperature and the impact when we reach the surface film. What's our speed? 20,000 knots. Well, we've reached water plant six. Now for the climb up the stem to the surface. Overseer. Overseer. Request more mucus from diatoms. Proceed with climb up stalk six. Yes, sir. If the diatoms can hold the stalk at the reduced pressure of the surface, we'll have hurdled the first barrier. We're at pressure six now, almost at the upper level. Captain. Yes? We've lost 27 diatoms. Ciliary detachment. Not serious. We have the vortai to fall back on. Proceed. Yes, sir. What's our pressure? Three coming into two now. We're already closer to the surface film than man has ever gone. Our unmanned test ships went through. Unmanned test ships are a different story, Lavin. Besides, if we do get through to the other side, our problems may just be starting. Oh, we're entering pressure one zone. Yeah. We're getting too much oxygen in the water. Engineer, switch to internal water supply for breathing. Lavin, what is it? The scopes, look. I can't look now. What is it? I think... Yes, I can see it. I can see the surface film. Describe it. A great black whirling mass. Huge boulders and asteroids being whirled and ground back and forth like some tremendous boiling mass of mud and stone. It isn't too late to turn back. No, the ship was built to go through the film. If we fail, at least we can die knowing we tried. Very well, sir. Overseer, order all diatoms. Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. <laughs> Film, Shar. Pressure on the ship is increasing. Overseer, more oxygen for the diatoms. Captain, the diatoms are dying. More oxygen. Keep moving. We're almost through. Shar, use the auxiliary vortai. Maybe the motion of their cilia and the thrust of the water. Overseer, bring up the vortai. Full speed ahead. We're, we're moving. We're making headway. 
Oh, the ship will only hold together. Char, we're through. We're on the surface. Open the viewing port. It's blinding. Put on your eye shield. Look. Look, Char. Like a huge sheet of metal stretching as far as the eye can see. With thousands of small streams and great rivers of water. Look above us, Lavin. Space. Space as far as one can see. And a single huge sun like a great eye looking down at us. Must be billions of miles above us. See those enormous boulders and that molten rock on the surface? The ancients did not lie when they made the plates, Lavin. The universe does exist beyond the surface. Yes, but where are your creators, sure? Certainly they were a romantic notion. I believe they exist, Lavin. Char! I... Captain, Captain, the diatoms are dying. There's not enough oxygen in the water case. What's the atmosphere like? Almost 30% oxygen, completely unbreathable. We'll have to try to get back into the surface film to restore life to the diatoms. Overseer, get the diatoms out of their shells. Full reverse speed down the stalk. We're going under again. Yes, sir. I'll try. We know one thing, Lavin. The surface can sustain life. Can't sustain ours much longer. Full reverse. It's no use, Captain. The diatoms are near death. Use the vortex. We haven't enough water, sir. They're starting to suffocate. We've got to get back beneath the surface. Lavin, we must... Think of what it means to mankind to know that the universe goes on, that it can sustain life. I don't know what to do, Shaw. We're finished. There must be a way. A way? Why don't you pray to your creators now? Perhaps they'll help you. And that's for me. I'm resigned to death. I cannot share your bitterness, Lavin. We have enough water for perhaps two minutes breathing, Shaw. There are no miracles and no creators. You'd better prepare to die. I am as ready as you, Lavin. Captain! Captain, we're strangling! Well, Shaw, why don't you pray to the creators? Better still, let me. I have a louder voice. Hey, creators, you all-powerful ones who made us, can you hear me? This is Captain Lavin of the first ship to breach the surface. We need your help. Can you hear me? We need your help. If there be creators, and I believe there are, then I ask that our presence be noted and that we be delivered from this trial, not for ourselves, but for the good of the race. Doctor? The ship has emerged from the film and is lying on the surface. There is no movement now. Probably strangling from lack of water. Very likely. What are you going to do? It's a pity they can't get back again. Eventually, they may have to learn to live on the surface when the temperature changes. Why not help them? You've played God before. Why not, indeed? Switch on the electron magnet. Ready. Now then, if I can just breach the surface tension near them, they'll be sucked under again. As in a whirlpool. If they survive... You've got to hurry. Here goes. Can't live much longer, Sean. No. It's getting... What? What's that? I don't know. We're moving. Downward. Lavin, it's a vortex. A vortex is opening through the surface. One way or another, we'll die. The ship can't take the stress. We're dropping. Sure. The water is circulating again. It's, it's too much to believe, Char. It, it's like... A miracle. Yes. It is a miracle. Well, Doctor? They've gotten through. The ship is floating down toward the bottom now. I wonder what they thought at the moment they were saved must have seemed to them as if the hand of God reached out to help them. Very likely. Do you suppose they prayed? To whom would they pray? I don't know. Perhaps to us, to the creators. It is not inconceivable. If only the human race, as, as we know it, had creators who could reach down and save us from destruction. How do you know we don't? Professor, I'm a scientist. So am I, Doctor. Those submicroscopic humans can't see us because we're too big to see. A molecule of our flesh would be like a world to them. And yet, we exist. We cannot hear their individual voices, perhaps, but we are capable of intervention of a sort. Is it not conceivable that our own plight might not be seen and recognized? What else is there at this time but to admit our inadequacy, 
and to cast off this arrogance that gives us bitter pride instead of humility. Where are you going, Professor? To pray, Doctor. There isn't much time. Professor. Yes? Wait. I will come with you. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine which this month features Jackpot by Clifford D. Simak. After years of searching, they had discovered the richest strike in the whole galaxy. But what in the name of space was it? Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Surface Tension, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by James Blish and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten, Danny Ocko, Lawson Zerby... Larry Haynes, Mason Adams, James Stevens, and Robert Hastings. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Scott Buckley and is an NBC Radio Network production. In just a moment, X-1, but first... There it is again. Say it with music. Your invitation to two full hours of the best live music weekday mornings on NBC Bandstand. This week, Ralph Flanagan's group, plus Russ Morgan and his orchestra, bring you metal and relaxing tunes. But don't get too relaxed, because the four lads are back again as Messrs. Music. And Burt Parks, your bandstand MC, keeps you smiling between numbers. It's a great show live all this week on NBC Bandstand. And now, stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, a story by Frederick Pohl, Tunnel Under the World. On the morning of June 15th, Guy Burkhart woke up screaming. Ah! It was more real than any dream he'd ever had in his life. He could still hear and feel that sharp metal ripping explosion, that searing wave of heat. He sat up. Mary! 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 Mary, where are you? Guy, what's wrong? You're trembling. Where were you? In the kitchen cooking breakfast. What is it? Oh, I dream, I guess. An explosion. Did you say an explosion? Yes. But that's the dream I had. What? I dreamed there was a big explosion and then something sort of hit me on the head. Holy smokes. Maybe there really was some sort of explosion, and it started us dreaming. Well, there'll be an explosion down at your office if you don't hurry and get to work. Coming in on the bus, Burkhart watched to see if there was any evidence of an explosion. There wasn't. If anything, the town looked better than ever. The only thing that seemed strange to him 
was the fact that none of the usual crowd was on the bus. He was a little relieved when he did see his old pal, Henry Swanson. Excuse me. Henry. You pardon me, sir, please. Henry, what's the matter with you? It's me, Guy Burkhardt. Burkhardt? Sorry, I, I don't believe we've met. What? Henry, for Pete's sake, it's me. If you'll excuse me, this is my stop. Well, I'll be... How do you like that? Guy Burkhardt got off in front of the gigantic Contro Chemical Building and took the elevator to the 98th floor where he had worked in the accounting department for 12 years. It wasn't until he was almost at his floor that he realized the speaker wasn't playing the usual commercials. Are you happy with your present home freezer? Of course not. Well, the answer to your problem is a feckle freezer. Feckle freezers are better freezers. Most wives would do anything for a feckle freezer. Are you happy with your present home freezer? Of course not. Good morning, Miss Orne. Good morning, Mr. Burkhart. Oh, new hair, do I see? Well, yes. Do you like it? it? Makes a lot of difference in your appearance. Is uh, Mr. Barth in? Why, no, sir. He, uh had an appointment with Mr. Dorchin at the advertising agency. Today? But today's the 15th of June. He has to sign the quarterly statement. He said he wouldn't be in. Hmm, that's mighty peculiar. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Miss Horn, what the devil is a feckle freezer? A feckle freezer? There's some new copy on the elevator commercial. Dorchin must have landed another account. <laughs> feckle freezers. I really don't know, Mr. Burkhart. It's a funny day. I can't quite put my finger on it. There's something strange going on. He couldn't shake the thought out of his mind. It persisted all through the day and through dinner. He was still brooding as he and Mary got ready for bed. I guess I'll get a good night's sleep. Coming? I think I'll sit up and read for a while. All right, dear. Good night. Good night, dear. At exactly midnight, Guy Burkhart lapsed into a sudden, deep sleep. And the following morning, he woke up screaming. <laughs> Darling, what is it? What's wrong? Uh, uh, oh, nothing. <clears throat> a bad dream, I guess. Oh, you gave me such a shock. I... I seem to be having a lot of nightmares lately. Really? Yes. The, the one I had yesterday. This was the same. A, a big explosion and then nothing. You had a dream yesterday? Of course I did. You had the same sort of dream. I? Oh, Guy, you're mistaken. I don't remember dreaming. Mary, you told me. Guy, you're mistaken. But, Mary... Maybe you dreamed I had a dream. Maybe you... Yes, I might have done that, I suppose. Everything did seem sort of strange yesterday. That's probably it. You'd better get dressed, dear. Today's the 15th, and that's when the quarterly statement... The 15th? Yes. Well, then, then it must have been a dream. Because yesterday was the 15th. Guy Burkhart got up, dressed, ate breakfast, and took the usual bus to work. Once again, everything seemed even brighter and newer than usual. Once again, he was puzzled when he noticed none of the old crowd on the bus. Pardon me, please. Look, don't shove so. Oh, Henry, good morning. Good morning. Don't you recognize your neighbors? I don't believe we've met. Henry, it's me, Guy Burkhart. What's going on? I'm sure I don't know, sir. For God's sake, don't talk to me. What is it? Are you being followed or something? Don't you know? I was sure you remembered. Remembered what? talk. This is my stuff, so will you please excuse me? Henry! Henry, for Pete's sake! As in yesterday's dream, Guy Burkhart got off at his stop and took the elevator to the 98th floor. The speaker in the elevator purred a new commercial this time. Marlin cigarettes. They're sanitized. Does your present cigarette make your throat feel raspy and unpleasant? Marlin cigarettes contain a miraculous new drug which actually gives you the sensation of smooth, 
creamy smoke. Marlin cigarettes. Marlin cigarettes. Marlin cigarettes. He walked down the marble corridor to his office. Good morning, Mr. Burkhart. Good morning, Miss Horn. You like my new hairdo? Why, yes. Uh, is Mr. Barth in? No, sir. He had an appointment, appointment with, with Mr. Mr. Dorchin, Dorchin at the agency. I know. You know? I guessed it anyway. And today's the 15th of June, and he won't be here to sign the quarterly statement. And I'm going nuts. Let me have a cigarette, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, try one of these. They're Marlins. I never heard of Marlins before today. What are we? A bunch of guinea pigs for Dorchin's new advertising accounts? Is something wrong, Mr. Burkhart? Wrong? Perish the thought, Miss Horn. Perish the thought. Hello? This is Swanson. Henry Swanson. What is it? you remember? Remember what? Just remember. Listen, Henry, let's stop playing games. Yesterday, either I was dreaming or you snubbed me on the bus. Today, the same thing happens. Oh, you do remember, thank heavens. I thought so when I saw you, but I couldn't be sure. What is it you want? Listen, tomorrow morning, when I get off the bus, you get off with me. But be casual. They may be watching. Who may be watching? Swanson. H Hello? You buy it, Mr. Berkman? Yes. I'm still out of cigarettes. Would you buy me a pack of Kelvins? Wouldn't you rather have Marlins? I smoke Kelvins. But, Mr. Burkhart, Marlins have that soft, creamy smoke that's so soothing to your throat. <laughs> you really believe that stuff? It's true. I, I wouldn't say this, Mr. Burkhart, except that... Well, I've gotten to know you pretty well, and I'm, I've grown to admire you so much. I see. Would you mind, Mr. Burkhart, if I told you that, that for months now I've, I've wanted to, well, just comfort you? Mm -hmm. I know how troubled you've been. You've never mentioned your feelings, Miss Horn. April. My first name is April. That's a pretty name. You see, I do have your welfare at heart. That's why when I see you smoking Kelvins, and I know Marlins are so much better, won't you let me buy some of them for you? I suppose so. Why not? Uh, here, you bring me a carton. Thank you, Mr. Burkhart. Guy. I, uh... <clears throat> I'll be back. There was something wrong, something definitely peculiar about what was happening. The call from Henry Swanson, the strange behavior of this secretary, Miss Horn, these new products, the dream. Guy Burkhart went home that night feeling like a man in a nightmare. That you, dear? Yes, me. Have a good day. Where? Oh, before you sit down, would you go down the cellar and put in a new fuse? The switch in the hall closet blew out, and I shut it off. Okay. Supper will be ready in a minute, so don't start fooling around with that old boat hull you've been building. I won't. Mary! Mary! What is it? Come down here. Hurry up! What is it? Uh, I'm not sure. I was looking for a fuse, and I thought maybe I'd drop one under the boat hull, so I scratched around. Look. Let me put the flashlight on it. Well? Look at the floor. What about the floor? It's supposed to be cement. Well? It's copper. There's a thin layer of cement, but underneath it's metal. Look here. Underneath the concrete, more metal. There. And here, on the wall, metal. Metal under the floor, behind the walls, every place. Well, I don't really understand. Mary, I know this sounds crazy, but somebody, for reasons I can't begin to guess, has taken this house and replaced it with a clever imitation. God. I know it sounds insane, but take a look. That bracing on the beams, 
That isn't the bracing that was always there. Oh, you're imagining. I am not imagining. Mary, I'm going to look around for a little more. Well, your dinner will be ready. Save it for me. There are a couple of things I have to figure out. The following morning, Guy Burkhart woke up screaming. He dragged himself into the kitchen where his wife Mary was preparing breakfast and discovered it was still June 15th. Mary, Mary, listen. Guy, what is it? You're trembling. Mary, the dream. Dream? About the explosion. The same one we've been having. We? I didn't dream about any explosion. You did. Why are you covering up? Covering up? Guy, what's happened to you? It happened. It happened. What? Where's the morning paper? Where is it? Outside the door, I guess. <laughs> June 15th. Well, you'd better hurry. Today's the day Mr. Barth fills out the quarterly tax return. No, it isn't. What? He won't be there. He'll be at a meeting with the head of the advertising agency. Mr. Dorchin? He'll be there. And Miss Horn will have a new hairdo. And the elevator will be selling some new product. And Swanson. What about Swanson? Swanson. He's... I wonder... I wonder if it's going to be the same today or, or whether... Guy, what in the world are you talking about? <sighs> Nothing. Where's my coat? You haven't had breakfast. I don't want to miss my bus. I'll see you tonight. Guy Burkhart got on his bus. There were the same unfamiliar faces, the same unusually new-looking buildings, the same unusually bright sunshine, and Henry Swanson, pale and furtive. Oh, excuse me, sir. You're quite all right. Do you remember the phone call? Yes. Oh, thank heaven. Get off at the next corner and follow me. Where are you going? There's an excavation for a building about a block down. But make sure you aren't followed. I'll go first. Burkhart. Burkhart, here behind the fence. Uh, now, Henry, what's this all about? Just a minute. I want to make sure you aren't followed. Followed by whom? By them, of course. And just who are they? I'm not sure. At first, I thought perhaps they were Russians. Now, I, now I'm beginning to think they're Martians. No humans could have accomplished what they've accomplished. Look, start from the beginning, Henry. What's going on? Burkhart, peculiar things have been happening to you, right? Yes. A lot of your friends are missing. Your house seems changed. Yeah, there's something stranger than that. The date today is June 15th. Yet I could swear that yesterday was June 15th and the day before that. Yes, you've got it. It's always June 15th. And you and I are the only ones who know it. But why? How? I'm not sure. I, I think it's some sort of mass hypnosis or something. Why didn't it work for us? Um, my wife Mary doesn't remember a thing. Somehow when it happened, they missed us. We were protected from the full force of the... The rays or whatever they used. Burkhart, where were you on the night of the 14th, about midnight? That was Sunday night. Yes. I was down in the cellar, under that boat I'm building. And I was in my dark room developing some pictures. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Russians, Martians. <laughs> what makes you think so? I've seen them. Where? At the end of the tunnel. What tunnel? The one that they built under Tyler Town. Tunnel under Tyler Town? Yes, that's right. It's made out of copper or some alloy. Wait a minute. I found a copper layer under my cellar floor last yes, night. Yes, so did I. That's how I discovered it. I found a way to get in, too. It's at the bottom of this excavation. Holy mackerel. Why don't we tell the police? Because we can't trust them. Even the police may be Martians in disguise. You're being melodramatic. Am I? You just come with me. Where? Into the tunnel. I'll show you. Henry Swanson led Guy Burkhardt to a small hole in the side of the excavation. There he removed a cut-out piece of metallic substance, and they crawled into a dimly lighted tunnel. They walked for what seemed like two miles, until Swanson held his finger to his lips. 
You've got to be quiet now. Henry, this is fantastic. They've got a tunnel right under the whole town. Oh, Burkhardt, you haven't seen anything yet. There's a room a little further down. We'll be able to look through a glass in the door. Is it safe? Oh, it's perfectly safe. Unless one of them comes along. Now, come on. Here. Look through this glass. Now, just so I know I'm not completely insane, tell me what you see. Good Lord. Well... A tremendous panel with dozens of telescreens. And in front of each, a servo robot. They, they seem to be computing something. Yes. I've watched them. They're evaluating data from the screens. Evaluating? Why not? Each of them has a part of a human mind. Remember that? It's against the law to transfer an evaluating circuit from a human brain to a robot. Burkhardt, whoever is conducting this monstrous experiment is operating far outside the law. Uh, have you gotten a chance to look at the data on those screens? No. No, I, I've been afraid to go in. There might be a warning circuit somewhere. If we knew what those robots were working on, we could go to the authorities. Well, I'll risk it if you will. It's worth a chance. We're lost anyway. Okay. Open the door. So far, so good. Come on. Let's take a look at that data. Yes, but don't interfere with the robots. Don't worry. Let's look at the screen. Listen to this. Tests in the 47K12 group with Marlin cigarette pulled 80% using the soft feminine approach. Indications are that an extension of this approach would sell at least 70% nationwide. On the Feckel freezers, the direct elevator pitch pulled only 10%. This should be abandoned and a new series of high persuasion elements introduced. Henry, you know what this means? I haven't the faintest idea. I don't blame you. It's crazy. But it fits the facts when I think about it. Do you know who's behind this? Martians. Not Martians, Henry. Advertising men. What? I don't know who they are or how they've done it. But somehow they've taken Tyler Town over. They've got you and me and 30,000 others right under the thumbs. Hypnosis. Hypnosis drugs. Maybe some kind of ray or something. However they do it, what happens is that they let us live through a single day. During that day, they pour all kinds of suggestions and propaganda into us. At the end of the day, they evaluate the results, see how we've reacted. Then at midnight, they wash the day out of our minds. And the next morning, we start the same day over again with different stimuli. No, I, I can't believe that. I know it sounds ridiculous, but think of it. They can run the perfect test and on a whole community. Do you know what that means? Suppose one man learned how to influence people 100%. In a year, he could sell us anything from freezers to political candidates. Oh, now, wait a minute. We're God. guinea pigs, Henry. This whole community is one big test tube for propaganda research. What do we do? Somehow, we get out of this town and get to the FBI. Do you think we can? Yeah, it's worth a try. Come on. Wait. What is it? Look. Look. There's somebody coming down the tunnel. We've got to hide. Quick, behind the circuit box. Shh. Good Lord. It's Dorchin, the head of the agency that does our advertising. Quiet. All right, Burkhardt, come out. We know you're in this room. Miss Horn has informed us that you remember. I must warn you, it's useless to buck us. Come out peacefully and let our maintenance crew adjust you properly so you don't remember from one experiment to the next. It'll be quite painless. If you don't come out peacefully, we'll have to get you. Henry, take this wrench. 
When I give the word, jump him. He may be armed. We've nothing to lose. Very well. I'm coming after you. Now! Burkhart. Burkhart, I've killed him. Wait. I get his coat unbuttoned. Maybe his heart is still beating. Henry. What is it? What's wrong? Look. Underneath his coat. Oh, heaven help us. It's a robot. A humanoid robot. Designed to look like Dorchin. Come on, let's get out of here. Wait. What? What's that? A loudspeaker. I told you it was useless, gentlemen. Who are you? Mr. Dorchin, naturally. The real Mr. Dorchin. What are you trying to do to us? Merely trying to prevent you from damaging my experiment, gentlemen. You can't get away with this, Dorchin. Sooner or later, somebody, the FBI or somebody, is going to get wind of this madness. Oh, now, really, Burkhart, you're quite naive. Now, why don't you be reasonable and let the maintenance crew adjust you? If I refuse, I suppose you'll kill me. That would be quite impossible. Oh? You see, Burkhart, you're already dead. Dead? You're shocked. It's quite true. You and everyone else in this town were killed by premature atomic blast at the Contro Chemical Plant. The blast occurred at 7 a.m. on June 15th. That's the last thing imprinted on your mind. That's why you wake up screaming each morning. It isn't true. Oh, but it is. What I and my associates did was take the brain circuits from your dead bodies. We stored them in electrochemical batteries until we had a chance to rebuild the cities and begin our tests. Do you think I believe a, a fantastic tale like that? I imagine you find it incredible. Of course, we didn't rebuild everything exactly. After all, it only has to last for a single day. June 15th. At midnight, we turn off the power and wash out the memory of the day. You and your friend Swanson, unfortunately, have defective circuits. You remember. Burkhardt, it's no use. We're trapped. Please give up. Not me. But what can we do? We can make a run for it down the tunnel. Come on. It's useless, Burkhardt. Keep going. It's useless. 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 Burkhardt. Burkhardt, it's no use. You go ahead. I'm finished. Look, we're almost the end of the tunnel. I can see a door. Here, I'll help you. I can. Just a little further. No. Now, here. here. This door is open. It opens. Oh, no. I don't believe it. I can't run anymore. Come on. Come on. Come on. You go ahead. Look. I'm finished. Look, we're almost the end of the tunnel. There was I can see a door. On the Here, I'll help you. I can. Just a At little further. The no. way into a chasm so deep no. they could no. not see the bottom. The star is open. Beyond was only a glare so bright that their eyes could not stand to look into it. And yet, just beyond the limit of their vision, something towered. Something so huge it was almost inconceivable. Something... Burkhardt. Yeah. Yes? This is Dorchin. Now, do you understand why it's useless? The great looming figure moved closer. It seemed to take shape now, and yet it was so gigantic as to be unbelievable. It came closer. The glare was partially blocked, and then Guy Burkhart knew that the towering shape was none other than Dorchin himself. You see how I did it, Burkhart? I took your brain circuits and had them reduced so they could be transferred to tiny humanoid mannequins. That's what you are, Burkhart, a tiny miniature of yourself. And this city, this whole experiment I'm conducting, is built on a tabletop. It was the morning of June 15th, and Guy Burkhart woke up screaming. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Man of Distinction by Michael Shara. Being completely unique in this world is not only a mathematical impossibility, 
It is also a matter of pride. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Tunnel Under the World, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Frederick Pohl and adapted for radio by George Leffers. Featured in the cast were Norman Rose, Dean Alnquist, Amy Siddell, Elaine Rost, Bob Hastings, Ken Rapif, and Larry Haynes. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Scott Buckley and is an NBC Radio Network production. Music of Russ Morgan live on Bandstand weekday mornings on NBC Radio. In just a moment, X minus one, but first. Boy, that kind of music went out with a handlebar mustache, didn't it? But the kind of wonderful melodies you'll hear on NBC's Bandstand are guaranteed to remain popular throughout the years. This is Bert Parks, your Bandstand MC. I'd like to invite you to spend two full hours each weekday morning with America's top-name bands, groups like Guy Lombardo, the Dorsey Brothers, and Ralph Flanagan. They'll entertain you in person. So listen Monday through Friday to NBC Bandstand. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. After tonight's broadcast, X-1, the adult science fiction show, will not be heard until Wednesday, September 26th. It will be heard on Wednesdays thereafter. For the exact time, consult your local newspaper. And now, X minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... This week, the police chiefs of the country are meeting in Chicago for the 63rd Annual Conference of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Tonight, X-1 is proud to salute them as we present The Lifeboat Mutiny by Robert Sheckley. Of course, we should have known better. In a way, we were asking for it, but frankly, we were short of credits and beggars can't be choosers. As a rule, I don't like second-hand equipment, not if I have to trust my life to it. But Joe, the interstellar junk man, can be pretty persuasive. He has an air of confidence when he walks down between the rows of antique jalopies on his lot and pats an airlock door lovingly or kicks at the ground gyros to show how firm they are. Joe exudes faith the way trees drip sap in the spring. And if you get too close, a little rubs off on you. Yeah, you see, solid as a rock. Look at that plating. I'm telling you, this boat is a real buy. Well, she looks pretty old. Sure, she's old. Uh, now, don't give us that story about it belonging to a little old lady who used it to flip to church on Sundays. Now, look, boys, I'm not trying to unload something on you. I don't stand to make a nickel on this, but tell me the truth. Did you ever hear sweeter engines? And look at those servos. Pretty old. And that hull. I bet it's 500 years old and not a spot of corrosion on it. I'm telling you, you're lucky. It's a coincidence, you two fellas coming in. You need a lifeboat. And sitting right here waiting for you, like you was made for each other, is this baby. Well, she certainly does seem rather nice. What do you think about it, Dick? It does look pretty good. 
It's about what we need for the ocean survey work on Trident. But you know Joe. Ah, they just don't build them this way anymore. Look at that propulsion unit. You couldn't dent it with a trip hammer. And note the capacity of the cooling system. It looks good, but some of these old machines, you know, I just want to make absolutely sure it's safe. Safe? <laughs> safe. He asked me if it's safe. Is it? Now, uh, step inside. Go ahead. Step inside. All right. Push that button. Right there on the instrument panel. This one? Yeah. I am lifeboat 324A. Hey, the darn thing talks. Yeah, and in English, too. <laughs> it's equipped with a universal translator. It's completely automatic. I told you, they just don't build them this way anymore. Go ahead. Push the button again. I am lifeboat 324A. My primary purpose is to preserve those within me from peril and to maintain them in good health. At present, I am only partially activated. Would anything be safer? Oh, this is no senseless hunk of metal. This boat will look after you. This boat cares. I don't know. The idea of an emotional machine always gets me. I can't even stand those robot maitre d's. They keep slobbering over you every time you go into a restaurant with their tubes just pouring kindness and consideration. Ah, you're a reactionary. We'll take it. You won't be sorry. Boys, you just bought yourselves a lifeboat. Joe delivered this assurance in the frank and open tones that had helped make him a millionaire several times over. It wasn't that he was dishonest. Far from it. All the flotsam he collected from anywhere in the universe worked. But ancient machines often had their own idea of how a job should be done. They tend to get peevish when forced into another routine. Well, there she goes, lifeboat 324A. I got her down in the afterhold. I think she's in perfect condition. You know, it's just what we need for those oceans on Trident. I hope so. The last thing I bought from Joe was an electric razor. Only it turned out that it came from Deneb 3, where they are slightly reptilian. And an electric razor is used to help them change their skin in the hot months. If you remember, I was in the hospital three months, and after the skin grafts, I don't know my ears from my elbow. This job we were on was to survey the planet Trident for a real estate speculator who bought it for subdivision. Trident was about the size of Mars, but with a far better climate. There was no native indigenous population, no poisonous plants, and no germ-borne diseases. As a matter of fact, apart from one small island and one small polar ice cap, the entire planet was covered with water. There was no real shortage of land. You could wade across some of Trident's several seas. Our firm had been hired to survey and plan a little mountain raising because the sector council frowned on selling building lots under four feet of water. We landed on Trident and launched the lifeboat. Okay, I got the sandwiches in the water. Ready to cast off? Aye, aye, sir. All mooring lines are on board. All right, let's crank this swan boat up and get going. Well, push that button. <laughs> aye, aye. I am lifeboat 324A. My primary purpose is to preserve those within me from peril and to maintain them in good health. At present, I am only partially activated. For full activity, press button two. Now, there it is, right next to the first one. Well? Something's going on back there. Sounds like motor's warming up. Hey, that sounds like a short circuit somewhere. You know there's no wheel on this thing? Oh, wait a minute. There's got to be some kind of tiller or control. Well, you look. That's all there are, two buttons. Well, then maybe she controls telepathically. I'll try it. Hey, uh, 324A, go ahead slowly. Ah, there she goes. That's it. Starboard a little. Uh, wait a minute. I still don't like the sound of that. I bet there's a short somewhere. I'm going down to look for it with a circuit tester. Don't louse anything up. I like a boat that works this way. It gives me a sense of power. Hey, 324A, 
Full speed ahead. Arnold disappeared into the builds with a circuit tester, and I handled the survey. Actually, our machines did all the work, tracing the major faults in the ocean bottom, locating the most promising volcanoes. And when the survey was complete, the next stage would be turned over to the subcontractor. He would wire the volcanoes, seed the faults, and touch the whole thing off. After that, there'd be enough dry land on Trident for anybody. Now, by mid-afternoon, I figured we could knock off for a while. We ate our sandwiches, took a drink of water from the canteen, and then had ourselves a swim in Trident's clear green water. Hey, give me a hand up. That was very refreshing. Oh, yeah. I'll have to get this grease off with sandpaper, but I think I found the trouble. You see, the leads to the primary activator have been removed and the power cable's been cut. Well, why would anyone do that? Well, it might have been part of the decommissioning, but I got it hooked up now. Go ahead, hit the second button. Might as well have this thing working right. Okay, here she goes. Activated and able to protect my occupants from danger. Have faith in me. My action response tapes, both psychological and physical, have been prepared by the best scientific minds in all drones. Ah, that's more like it, huh? Gives you a feeling of uh, confidence, doesn't it? I suppose so. But where is drone? Well, gentlemen, try to think of me not as an unfeeling mechanism, but as your friend and comrade in arms. I understand how you feel. You have seen your ship go down, Hmm? cruelly riddled by the implacable Hagen. What ship? What's it talking about? You have crawled aboard me, dazed, gasping from the poisonous fumes of water, half dead. Oh, no, wait a minute. You mean that swim we took? You got it all wrong. We were just surveying. Half dead, shocked, wounded, morale low. You were a little frightened, perhaps, and well, you might be separated from the drome fleet and adrift upon an alien planet. A little fear is nothing to be ashamed of, gentlemen. But this is war, and war is a cruel business, and we have no alternative but to drive the barbaric again across space. There must be a reasonable explanation for all this. Probably an old television script got mixed up in its response bank. We better give it a complete overhaul. We can't listen to that stuff all day. Well, we're about a quarter of a mile from the island. Ah, I'll tell you what. I'll take it down and clean the goo out of the contacts when we get there. Hey. What's going on? We're stopping. Hey, hey, lifeboat. Quiet. Calm. Trust in me. I am scanning the island. What's he talking about, scanning me? Better humor him. Lifeboat, uh, that, that island's okay. We, we, we checked it personally. Perhaps you did. But in modern lightning-quick warfare... Drone senses cannot be trusted. They are too limited, too prone to interpret what they wish. Electronic senses, on the other hand, are emotionless, eternally vigilant, and infallible within their limits. But there isn't anything there. I perceive a foreign spaceship on the island. Oh, that's our ship. It has no drone markings. Well, it hasn't any enemy markings either. I painted it myself. In war, we must assume that what is not ours is the enemy's. I understand your desire to set foot on land again, but I take into account factors that a drome motivated by his emotions would overlook. Consider the apparent emptiness of the strategic bit of land, the unmarked spaceship put temptingly out for bait, the fact that our fleet is no longer in this vicinity. All right, all right, that's enough. Now, I'm tired of arguing with you. Go directly to that island. That's an order. I cannot obey that order. You are unbalanced from your harrowing escape from death. All right, all right, enough of this nonsense. I'm just going to take that cutoff switch and... Come to your senses, gentlemen. Only the decommissioning officer is empowered to turn me off. For your own safety, I must warn you not to touch any of my controls. You are mentally unbalanced. Later, when our position is safer, I will administer to you. Now my full energies must be devoted 
towards detection and escape from the enemy. Where are we going? To rejoin the drone fleet as soon as I can find you. We sailed over the empty seas of Trident for the rest of the afternoon and far into the night. At about midnight, we sat in the cabin sharing our last sandwich. The lifeboat was still rushing madly over the waves, its every electronic sense alert, searching for a fleet that had existed 500 years ago upon an entirely different planet. Oh, why didn't I pack more sandwiches? Mm. Do you ever hear of these drones? Yeah, vaguely. They were non-human, lizard-evolved creatures. Mm. Yeah, they lived on the sixth planet of some little system near uh, Capella. The race died out over a century ago. Mm-hmm. And the Hagen. What about them? Also lizards, same story. Mm. Wasn't a very important war, you know. All the combatants are gone except this lifeboat, apparently. And us. We've been drafted as drone soldiery. You think we can reason with this, Tom? Oh, no, I don't see how. As far as this boat is concerned, the war is still on. It can only interpret data in terms of that premise. It's probably listening in on us now. No, no, I don't think so. Hmm? See, it's not really a mind reader. Its perception senses are geared only to thoughts aimed specifically at it. Yes, siree, they just don't build them this way anymore. Oh, I wish I could get my hands on Joe. Well, you know, it's actually a very interesting situation. The machine is acting very logically upon no longer existent conditions. Therefore, you could say that the machine is the, uh, well, the victim of a systematized delusion. You mean the lifeboat is just plain insane? Well, I believe paranoia would be the proper designation. Ah, but it'll, it'll end pretty soon. Why? It's obvious. The boat's prime objective is to keep us alive. Our sandwiches are gone, and the only other food is on the island. I figure it'll have to take a chance and go back. Gentlemen. At present, I am unable to locate the drone fleet. Therefore, I am turning back to scan the island again. Fortunately, there are no enemies in this immediate area, so I can devote myself to your care. Oh, you see, it's about time you got around to us. We're hungry. Feed us. Of course. Immediately. There you are. On the tray. What's that? That looks like clay. Oh, it smells like machine oil. Hey, what's it supposed to be? That is geisel. Hmm? It's the staple diet of the drone people. I can prepare it in 16 different ways. Oh. Try it. All right. Mm. It tastes like clay coated with machine oil. We can't eat that. Of course you can. An adult drone consumes 5.3 pounds of geisel a day and cries for more. Now listen, we are not drones. We are humans, an entirely different species. The war you think you're fighting ended 500 years ago. We can't eat geisel. Our food is on the island. Ah, yes. Your delusion is a common one among fighting men. It is an escape fantasy, a retreat from an intolerable situation. Gentlemen, I beg you, Face reality. You face reality or I'll have you dismantled bolt by bolt. Threats do not disturb me. I know what you've been through. Possibly you've suffered some brain damage from your exposure to poisonous water. Poisonous? To drones. If absolutely necessary, I am also equipped to perform physical brain therapy. It is a drastic measure, but there can be no coddling in time of war. You see... You need not worry. All my scalpels are razor sharp and ready for immediate action. Oh, scalpels, huh? Well, we're feeling better already. It's a fine-looking batch of geisel, isn't it, Arnold? Oh, uh, uh, delicious. Nothing is too good for our boys in uniform. Mm. Do try a little. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, that's (coughs) delicious. Delicious. Good. I am moving toward the island now, and I promise you, in a little while, you will be more comfortable. Why? The temperature here is unbearably hot. It is amazing you haven't gone into a coma. Any other drone would have. Soon I'll have it down to drone norm of 20 degrees below zero. 
And now I'll play our national anthem. should be very comfortable. Drones live at 20 below zero. We're drones and no yeah. back talk. Those cooling tubes are all frost enough. Yeah, I just wrote my name in frost yeah. in the porthole. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Wait a minute. I got an idea. Just follow my lead. Why not? Lead on, fellow drone. Ah, uh, give me the canteen. What are you doing? Ah, uh, just, uh, just gonna get a little exercise. <laughs> Gotta stay fit, you know. That is true. Ah, uh, here you are, boy. Catch! Look out, that canteen's heavy. Ah, just throw it right back, boy. Just heave it right in. Come on, let's see your curve. Be careful with that receptacle. It's filled with a deadly poison. Water. Oh, we'll be careful. Here we go. Bad shot, old man. Oh, how careless of me. I seem to have broken the cooling tubes. Cooling fluid all over the floor. I should have taken precaution against internal accidents. It won't happen again. But the situation is very serious. I cannot repair the cooling tube myself. I'm unable to properly cool the boat. Say, that's tough. Now, if you'll just drop us on the island... That is impossible. My first duty is to preserve your lives. And you couldn't live long in the climate of this planet. But I'm going to take necessary precautions to ensure your safety. What are you going to do? There is no time to waste. I will scan the island once more. If our drone forces are not present, we will go to the one place on the planet that can sustain drone life. What place? The southern polar ice cap. The climate there is almost ideal. 30 degrees below zero. And, of course, I must guard against any further internal accidents. So, I will lock you gentlemen in the cabin. Think. I am thinking. Nothing's coming out. We've got to get off when he reaches the island. It'll be our last chance. Now, look. We know his internal scanning isn't very good. When we reach the island, maybe we could cut his power cable. Oh, you couldn't get within five feet of it. He's got an electric charge on all the controls. Mm. I am now scanning the island. Uh, place looks fine today. Oh, sure does. I'll bet our forces are dug in underground. They are not. I scan to a depth of 100 feet. Well, uh, under the circumstances, I think we should examine it a little more carefully. It is deserted. I cannot let you endanger your lives by going ashore. Rome needs her soldiers, especially sturdy, heat-resistant types like you. We like this climate. Spoken like a patriot. I know you must be suffering, but now I am going to the South Pole to give you veterans the rest you deserve. Wait a minute. You don't understand. We're operating under special orders. We weren't supposed to disclose them to any vessel below the rank of Super Dreadnought. We're a suicide squad. Yes, yes, that's right. Especially trained for hot climate war. Our orders are to land and secure that island for the drone forces. I didn't know that. You weren't supposed to. After all, you're only a lifeboat. Land us at once. I couldn't guess, you know. All right. We'll head for the island. Arnold, it's going to work. Why not, as long as we tell him the truth? The beach is only 50 yards away. No. No. No what? I cannot do it. What do you mean? This is war. Orders. I know, but I cannot obey. A different type of vessel should have been chosen for this mission. But not a lifeboat. You must think of our country. Think of the barbaric Hagen. It is electronically impossible for me to carry out your orders. My prime directive is to protect my occupants from harm. That order is stamped on my every tape. 
giving priority above all others. I cannot let you go to your certain death. You'll be court-martialed for this. I'll have you broken down to a dinghy. I regret to say I must operate within my limitations. I must take you to the safety of the South Pole. Listen, you crazy tin can. Let me at those controls. I'll... Please, do not attempt any more destruction. I know how you feel, Wait a minute, Arnold, old friend. Since we cannot accomplish our mission, we cannot ever again face our comrades. Death before dishonor. Hand me the canteen. No, don't. That's water. It is a deadly poison. Don't. Don't. (sighs) Too late. Arnold, it's your turn. We who are about to die salute you. We die for glorious drone. That goes for me, too. Speak to me. Speak to me. Lie still, you idiot. There is no known antidote. If only I could contact the hospital ship. Speak to me. Are you still alive? Answer me. Here. Here. Perhaps if you eat some geesel. I'll read the burial service. Great spirit of the universe, take into your custody the souls of these your servants. Although they died by their own hand, still it was in the service of their country, fighting for home and hearth. Judge them not harshly for their impious deed. Rather, blame the spirit of war that inflames and destroys the spirit of all drones. And now, by the authority vested in me, by the Drome fleet, and with all reverence, I commend their bodies to the deep. Ow! Shut up. Accept them, O ocean, for many brave hearts are at slumber in the deep. Float quietly. What's the lifeboat doing? It's still hanging around. Just pray the drones didn't believe in cremation. Sleep quietly, brave spirits. I will now play the drone national anthem. Well, there she goes. Where? To the South Pole. To wait for the drone fleet. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Man Who Ate the World by Frederick Pohl. This is the story of a civilization which flowed with milk and honey and of a man whose tragedy was that he had not drowned at birth. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Lifeboat Mutiny, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Robert Sheckley and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Leon Janney, Mandel Kramer, William Redfield, and John McGovern. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. A special announcement to the audience of X-1, the adult science fiction show. X-1 will not be heard next week, but will resume broadcasts at a new time on Wednesday, September 26th, and every Wednesday evening thereafter. For the exact time of the broadcast in your locality, remember to consult your local newspaper. The music of Tommy Tucker, live on Bandstand, weekday mornings on NBC Radio.